Welcome everyone to 451 Degrees, the Unsafe Space Network's anti-censorship podcast. I'm Alex Maselli, and today I am being joined by Juana Trien. Hey. Hey. So uh, Juana is, uh, sorry, there's an that in here. Oh, wait, that's great for production. Um, <laughs> they want to uh, be on the wall. What? Yeah. <laughs> So uh, you you have your own YouTube channel, you're on Twitter, you have uh, a bunch of stuff out there that people could find. Um, and I obviously I do my research every time. Uh, so you are a former game developer. That's where you, where you really started as an adult. And um, so I'm young want- adult, very young adult. Yes, very young adult. <laughs> or is it like very beginning? And I right. um, I wanted to know. Um, What is your opinion? Like, were you involved at all in like the Gamergate like blow up? Like, did you have anything to say on the subject? Well, it was it was a strange time for me because I'd actually stopped. um, So I was very early in the industry. I mean, I was beat before uh, RPGs were even graphic. I mean, that's kind of giving me, you know, dating me. But I worked in what was called MUDs, which were multi-user dimensional interfaces or MUDs or MUSHs. They basically were text based games. And um, I was going to go and work over um, early, early on. Um, the, the, actually, the company I was working with was about to launch a, um, a, uh, a graphic version. Um, well, it was, it was different. I worked for um, a game, a company called Simutronics. And um, it, the, just the way life works, I actually ended a relationship that had been going on for about five years when I was uh, just graduating college. This was 2000. And so I basically just pulled the graphics card out of my computer because I was like, all right, I need to, I need to, you know, find, uh, you know, a life in New York. That's, you know, it, it, I knew that it was easy to just kind of get lost in that world and have it be, mm-hmm. he and I worked together as well. Um, but that said, you know, I've, I've always had a very, I've had a soft spot for gamers my whole life. You know, um, I was always that sort of, I was, a, you know, I'm a, I'm a proud geek, man. And, um, um, you know, the people that I worked with, I mean, a lot of them I'm still friends with to this day. Um, you know, these are people I've actually never even met, um, but it's, it, it doesn't matter. I mean, it feels like some of them I, I have, but some of them never, and they're some of my favorite people in the world. Um, but in addition to that, I met a lot of guys who were gamers. You know, um, we used to go, we used to have a regular con and, uh, you know, these guys were, you know, these were just fellow geeks, you know, geek, I, I define as you know, somebody who's unabashedly enthusiastic about what they love. That's really all it is. And these were people who were very smart and whether they were players or they were, you know, designers too. And we also had a you know, GM program. So we were working and, and interacting with players in real time. And, um, you know, I, I, I think that as a woman in that space, right, I know it was awesome to be a woman in that space, right? And, you know, I remember the rules of the internet, right? Like pre 4chan, you know, the ones that I think it was like 2000 and early, you know, they, they still came a little bit late in the game, but, you know, one of them said there are no girls on the internet. Remember that? Mm-hmm. But it's often, I think that's a misinterpreted rule, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, the first rule was something like, you know, um, God, if anybody could ever find it without all the 4chan additional stuff from on, on so it would be amazing because there were so many. And then it, this is what became rule 30, like 34 and 35. So everyone knows rule 34, which is, you know, um, if, if, uh, if it exists, there's porn of it. <laughs> so, yeah. And then 35 was, uh, if, it, if there is no porn of it, now there is. <laughs> but rule, I think it was rule number three or four was there's no girls on the internet. Really what that was saying is that even if you were a girl, you weren't treated differently. That was really what it meant. Um, I felt, it felt great. You know, I mean, I worked with guys, I mean, I, some of the best times I've ever had, you know, working with people on teams and it, really all we wanted to do was make really cool stuff for people. I mean, it was a time in which you had an idea. If you could find people to help you with it, boom, you could do it. And from what I understand of Gamergate, it felt to me like it was a, it was, there were people who were behaving very opportunistically and that women were, or girls <laughs> were taking advantage of a situation in which it, it's a space in which, you know, if you're going to get angry that somebody is sexualizing a character, 
first of all, grow up. <laughs> You know, I mean, it's not everything, listen, the marketplace is going to develop. I, mean, I remember Laura Croft and, you know, that, that stupid, like, hey, hey, you know? <laughs> like, it was ridiculous. But at the same time, you know, I mean, I got to play uh, or develop characters. There was a, I got to develop a, a team, like this couple that were um, tattoo artists and they were very, it was, it was kind of neat. Their, their whole, the whole premise was that, they had this bit of a like a BDSM sort of edge to them, right? So their names were Jonix and Vexla. And so basically she would, you know, demand that she, you know, you explain to her what why you would want this certain tattoo. And if she didn't think it was a good enough story, she'd say, come back. So it was a very tough and I and I'd say that in that period, I was probably about 19, I really got to I, there was no it, there was nothing about it that felt like I couldn't express myself or that people would try to sexualize me in any way that wasn't how do I put this it's a game for god's sake like if you're not going to be able to explore and play games and art and role play and, and I don't mean this in a in a kink way I mean this actually I just had a thought I guarantee you that most of these girls who were complaining about what was going on I wouldn't want to know what their fetish is I wouldn't want to know what their fetish is. I mean I'm serious I really, I really wouldn't because it's, it felt like everything became fetish. I mean, this is a kind of a thing I think we're dealing with even now. A lot of stuff became fetishized. And these guys that were being accused of, of all these things, like, let, let kids play. I mean, even when, it, you know, let people play. It's a game. Let people play. And then I remember hearing something about the one of them had created something that was terrible. It was just a crappy game. And, you know, if you can't put what you're creating above your ego, you know, I went to theater school and my mom the arts, it's just, the whole thing just reeked of something that felt like mean girls. And you, you know, you know, I, I don't think that a lot of guys know, really know what that is when, when we say that, because it's obviously, they're not women. They don't have that, you know, they're kind of starting to act a little bit like it, I have to say, um, so but yeah. <laughs> Especially since lockdowns, I have a theory on that. But actually, this is a thing: is I think that there are some spaces, there are some things that are we're always dear to men. Like I, in a good example, I'd say is like WWF, right? Mm -hmm. Like these are things that are, you know, I became really interested in learning about it because it's an art form that I never really understood. And then a few years ago, I you know kind of dove into it, and it's something that in my age, you know, you didn't get exposed to it. You know, I didn't have brothers. I you know, I was an only child. Most of my friends were men or guys. So that's how I got exposed to Star Wars. And I, I never liked Barbies and all these things. But these were faces that, like, they're sacred, you know? You know, if, if girls have things that we like to do and that are mostly girl spaces, and that's okay. When men or guys come into it, and boys, you know, whether there's a, there's a level of deference and sort of respect for something that exists, and in, in, it doesn't mean you're not welcome. But it doesn't mean you need to shove yourself in and expect the entire space to alter. Because remember why you wanted to be there in the first place. Yeah, like, there's a lot of like, there's a comment strip about that. Like, oh, this thing is not accommodating to what I want it to be. Right. Accommodate what I want it to be. Get out if you don't like the new accommodations. It's really like, mm -hmm. why? And there, there, there's at least four, I think, comics that depict that very scenario, which keeps happening. Um, and it, 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 it's happening a lot to geek culture, especially. It's also happening in other culture. I mean, I think that's a very interesting example of what happened in New York. By the way, the background in yours, you know, the snow versus, it's really funny. I'm just <laughs> yeah. Back and I thought that was my window and I was like. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in Florida right now. So, you know, but, um, so no, but in New York, I mean, I think that there's a level of, and I keep saying it's mean girl stuff because it really does feel like it. I mean, there's there used to be remember that whole rule about lurking lurk first rule was lurk meaning if you're going into a new i used to develop online communities too that was by the way the segue from gaming into the world i ended up working in um um new york nightlife but my my job was actually to bring the theater into nightlife because there was uh issues with you know drug ods and things and so my theory was one of the best ways to deal with that is you create a situation where people are just don't think of doing drugs because they're having too much fun like, you know, the, the mm -hmm. people, you know, and, and it, it actually worked really well. Um, but from there, I developed an online community that was for the nightlife world. It was a niche online community specifically. And it was um, 
uh, like a consumer reports of nightlife culture where we had intelligent discourse about nightlife culture and that and online communities I always looked at it using kind of the same mindset of what we did with you know uh, text-based games and the idea of lurking is this you know when you it's like when you go to a new town like I just mo I'm moving here to St. Petersburg right and I I show some deference that I don't know this place. I'm trying to get to know it, get to know the people, get to know the traditions, get to know the history. There's been this strange sort of um, lack of deference that I think has started everywhere. I mean, I think Gamergate might have been one of the first places we really saw it in what used to be a geek space. I mean, the, the, the digital stuff, like all of this, right? It was either bluntly, it was either created by geeks or, or, or people who were creating, you know, access to porn or both. <laughs> so yeah. Right. Right. And then of course, a little bit of military and education on top there, but yeah, you know, um, but you know, there used to also be sort of barriers for entry, like natural gates. Right. So, you know, you, you'd have to figure certain things out and, and, I sometimes will joke and say, I sort of wish we could do what we did with, you know, the what was called PVP, you know, player versus player. People yeah. who wanted to do that. So have a different server, like create a mm -hmm. server for everybody who, with one question, what was your first browser? If anybody says anything that's like, if you say mosaic, you're like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but even if you say Netscape, right? Like then, you know, because there was a, there was this understanding back then that, or maybe it was just this automatic because of those natural gates that existed, that challenge that existed. Um, you, you felt first, I think that gave you a sense of pride and, and, and appreciation and community automatically that you were somewhere. It also created a very collaborative environment, which is different than a cooperative environment. Collaborative, I think is an environment where everybody works together, but not equally. It's, it's every person's individuality is respected. It's not about, you know, every person having an equal part. You can't do that. That doesn't, no, it, 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 that's not possible. No, it's, that's one of the reasons that equity does. I mean, the only thing that we all do equitably is die. <laughs> so, <I'm> fair. <laughs> right, you no. Know? And so, um, and I think that, and they're even trying to get rid of that, which is a little weird. Hmm. Uh, <laughs> you know, these people need to game. Yeah. I mean, they, there's some games that still, I mean, obviously I'm a big gamer, uh, right. that when I they do, PV, yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm not good at them. I'm not good at them, but I, I'm, I play them all the time, oh, but I mean, like, yeah, there's a lot of PVP games still coming right. out that where you have to go into like a, a baby server first, like, <laughs> right. I mean, that, that, that's exactly what I'm saying. I mean, in New York, right. I, one of my theories about what's happened there is, people who moved there rather than showing this sort of deference, like similar, I think, to what happened with the gaming world, rather than going in and getting a sense for it and then creating within that world what you would like, rather than saying, you need to change to suit me, or I think this is what's going on because I'm bringing my shit with me, excuse me. I'm bringing my baggage with me. You're allowed um, to swear. <laughs> I, I, I know, I just don't know how much, I'm such a newbie even in, in YouTube, so I don't know what can create, <laughs> you know. Um, but about censorship, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, you know, um, so, you know, just do let me know if there's something I, I need to. No, um, I honestly, like, I'm so free speech absolutist that like, I'm sort of just like, I, I, it's very hard for me to prevent myself from saying something. Right. I, I think that there's an, there's a level of, um, we, when we get into it some more, like there is a level of wisdom with these things because you don't want to be taken, uh, lose access to your uh, ability to do something. But that said, mm -hmm. like, I would agree with you. I mean, the first person I always end up thinking of is, you know, Lenny Bruce, right? The, the comedian, you know, you know, who I'm talking about yeah. he was a comedian who basically said, you know, the words you can't say, I think it was him that said something that was brilliant though. He said, my audience is a genius which I love that. <laughs> and that's, and that's the thing too. I think in, in all of the stuff in, in the gaming world, like, I guess this sounds a little hokey, but I didn't think that the women who were involved in that actually loved gaming. Well, I think what they loved was manipulating. <laughs> they loved. And then of course, you know, there were some, certainly some bad actors who got involved, but that's what happens when you, when you begin to re remove some natural decency, you know, and um, 
there was always, I mean, look, there, I remember even back then, there were some people that were a pain in the neck. Like there was even this one, there were some problems. I mean, I remember the, but in the gaming world, I also remember this. This is why I felt so badly. I didn't, I, I wasn't in it, but I, from a distance, I felt so much sympathy because it's a sensitive world. People don't know this. I don't think. They think it's just a bunch of guys who like, you know, want to go shoot them up. And maybe there is a level of that for sure. Um, I would hope that in the PC gaming world, it's still as different than the console world. You know, I remember. I we still make jokes about it. <laughs> right. You know, uh, it's part of those barriers for entry, right? Like if, mm -hmm. you, if you've got to take the time to figure out how you're going to run the new, you know, gaming engine and like update your computer so they can handle it. That's a barrier for that. that, that you know, things shouldn't come so easily. Like, I think yeah. that that's part of what we've, we've created this environment of just both binary and also easy. And then we have something easy, there's no value. I mean, listen, we know there's a problem when out on Broadway in New York, some people were picketing their own show. <laughs> I mean, that shows that there are people who don't value. I mean, if you're working, I mean, I remember back in the day, I went, I don't know what's ever happened. A lot of, I mean, a lot of these companies were taken over by like much larger. So there's maybe an, even an argument. You know, I remember Looking Glass and I remember, you know, uh, I mean, Looking Glass was amazing remember that company um the smaller places and i know one guy who's still working in the world and there definitely is there's something that happened where i feel like there was a balance that broke where like a lot of us that were not there is a level of the sjw mindset that just comes from an oversensitivity and insecurity right and yes. like, and also I think that in the gaming world, especially, and I remember this, I was very active in, um, in early days of, uh, gay rights because I'm straight, but I grew up on Fire Island and I was very active with the early GMHC and I created um, a gay straight alliance in my high school. I, I don't know if I was the first in the country, but I just, it was an idea I had, I don't know. So there were two people who were gay, who I worked with, who, you know, kind of came out to me and it, and it, it's not because it's just not something that was really discussed. Like there was no, it, it was more likely that a guy was going to pretend to be a girl than, you know, a guy was going to talk about liking boys. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. It makes sense. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. And so um, it, it almost, it was like, it just wasn't this place for it. I mean, you didn't, there were some certain things that you just, you know, uh, if things were got into any sexual stuff, it was, it was kept private at the time. Unless it was Lounge Lizard Larry, was that what it was called? <laughs> yeah, that one. Okay. <laughs> For people who don't know, that was a game where the entire point was that you were you were supposed to get your 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 character who you play as first person, um, get your character laid. <laughs> yeah, it's like the first like really gimmicky like silly game like that uh, I think a lot of people think of like for adults or whatever uh, is it was, lounge or it, it was a, it was it a was cultural great. moment it really it was. was I mean I remember there was like where in the world is Carmen San Diego and lounge lizard Larry <laughs> like yeah, in life, those game two. Of life we were very actually now come to think of these games there was a lot of really like sexual games back then that I don't know if that's I don't think that really continued exactly in a way that that now I'm sure they exist but it's more like you know love sense or something or love ends or something you know, where it's like, like, totally in the porn world yeah you know? there there is porn video games uh <laughs> like just flat out porn well, but... listen, <laughs> the, the, the vr stuff i mean I, everything everybody was working at meta now guarantee you they were working in that space before <laughs> okay. i don't think people even realize like i mean if it, we have porn to thank for even even this we have porn to thank for. yeah that's probably true that's i mean yeah. I, th I i think like wanting sex was one of probably the biggest motivators for tech for for people to do things and like not asexual people but the majority of people uh like oh i'm gonna get tough and strong because it's it's sexy to be that and i can have get sex and i'm gonna make this thing that's gonna make me money and then i'm gonna well, get I think also laid. though i mean i think also though it wasn't even necessarily the people that i know who who have been really um innovative in the tech field right um especially back then it wasn't so much about getting late i mean look people with you know right now i mean i do have certain opinions on um e how easily kids can access porn now i think it's a problem but um but i think that's a parenting problem you know i don't think it's 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 not but um and i and i have seen certain things there where i'm just like holy crap 
Like this is yikes, right? So no, what, what, so we were saying, I said, there's an art to, the, to even to this stuff, right? There's an art, I think that everything has a, an, can have an artfulness to it, right? But of course, I, I, it's how I view the world. Everything is either game or theater or both, basically. Um, and there's always an art. art, art. So that, it, what I really mean by that, too, is that it's not binary. Like, that's mm -hmm. really what I think. I, it, it's uh, Ian McGilchrist, if you aren't familiar with him, does a great job talking about this idea of um, the importance of understanding that not everything, there's the, 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 the idea of non-duality, even in non-duality, right? Like, mm -hmm. not, I mean, so there's even a non, so there's some things obviously then that are binary. If there's a non-duality to non-duality, right? <laughs> I think that, you know, people wanting to be able to see, first of all, when it comes to sex, I think, and porn, there's also an element of connection. I mean, even if it's a little bit, you know, it's, it, there's an, people crave intimacy, not just to get laid, right? And so there's yeah. a lot of this stuff. There's sure there's money to be made. It's easier to, and a much larger market for people who want to be able to, you know, see cam girls, let's say, right? And that world, I mean, I know that, for example, Zoom was originally used mostly in the gay cult, in like the gay community as a way of camming. Like, I don't know if you knew that, but like, so I that's why, I, like, yeah, it's a really interesting little, like one of those interesting uh, uh, internet lore things. So that when Zoom mm -hmm. started being used, you know, I, I had some gay friends that was like, and so they ended up switching over to, there's another one, I can't remember what it's called, but it's often, I think uh, there's therapists that use it. I can't remember what it's called right now, but Zoom did buy it. And I mean, they, they moved over into another, mm -hmm. yeah, primarily. And so in many ways, I'm sure that they got their, they made a lot of their money and figured out a lot of their uh, bugs and stuff by doing, providing a certain kind of service. When you think about it, it makes sense. And I've heard this a lot about uh, people complaining about something that happens on the internet that the, this an internet platform will make itself big on sex uh on adult content not necessarily sex but stuff not made for kids they don't want minors involved kind of stuff right. and then once they're big they go like family friendly and they're like kick all the sex off and um, you know, like, like uh, what's it called did that um what was the name of the online? It was a really creepy community, actually, in my opinion. Uh, what was it called? Uh, Are you thinking of OnlyFans? Because they no, say it's terrible. No, the one, it was, a, it was a, there was a lot of, it was a lot of visual. It was a really like an SJW, big SJW platform for a really long time. It was like kind of like live journal, but not. Oh, are you talking about Tumblr? Yes. 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 Yeah. They were big on sex for a very long time. Yahoo <laughs> bought them though. And I mean, they, I think they bought them. They started censoring right away. Like, I mean, and then all yeah. those, all that, if you notice something though, that changed mm -hmm. Twitter. The minute that happened, they came over to Twitter. So you had yeah. all those maps that were there. So, I mean, nothing happens on the internet in a vacuum, right? Just like in the world, nothing happens. People like, do you guys, I mean, the, I get a kick out of this. Like there's some stuff people forget. Like people forget really why, for example, Facebook really took off when it did. And it has everything to do with Tila Tequila. I don't know if any of you remember who she was. Mm -hmm. So back in the day, you know, just as, you know, when I was doing online communities, which I don't call, I don't think social media is, was technically, that's what it is, but it's a very different animal, right? Mm -hmm. So I remember back in the days of like V Bulletin and other message boards and, and, and things like that. And then, so first you had, what was it? MySpace. I mean, after the, after live journal and things like that, then you had MySpace and Friendster, right? Mm -hmm. Those were kind of vying for it. So in MySpace was obviously, to me, I always described it kind of like a, Remember in your in high school, kids had their lockers all decorated, right? Like you opened up your locker on the front. Like it, to me, it felt like a bunch of kids had opened up their locker and you could see what was on the like inside. It was like that's how MySpace kind of felt to me. Mm -hmm. And then Friendster was a little bit more. Um, you know, you're supposed to only be with people you were friends with, right? Mm -hmm. And Facebook was around, but the thing that would happen is is that as as MySpace or Friendster grew, they couldn't handle the server. The server couldn't handle the the, the volume, and they'd get lag. Remember lag. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Kind of I, like I we, experience it in video games. So yeah, I know what lag is. Like a lot of people have no idea. Like they've never experienced lag just because of imagery, right? Mm -hmm. Images, you know, or, or just volume of people, right? So lag would hit and then people would all suddenly migrate from, it was for a while, it was between MySpace, Friendster, MySpace, Friendster, MySpace, Friendster. Then this person, her name is Tila Tequila. And this is one of those things, like it's one of those internet lore things that blow my mind because who she is now, the last I heard is just kind of crazy. So she was one of those one of the first like social media celebrities 
and she's this like little girl that you know tequila tequila ay, 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 you know kind of thing going and, and she was she was very you know buxom right and guys would like she had like a million followers or something on isis which at the time was maybe it was even only hundred thousand but it, it was it was a lot right mm -hmm. and somehow she moved to facebook and they followed her. Her. Yeah. Facebook was had the server space and was able to do it. I'm convinced that where that many went in that early deal that's it's not in the so you know, it's not in the movie, right? Yeah. Went into knowing they were about to have a huge influx and that they're gonna have enough servers that they can handle the volume and not have it. And that's I mean, I, I almost feel like we should if we could ever if I could ever sit down with what was his name from MySpace, the guy who uh everybody was friends with him when he first got onto MySpace. What was Oh Tom. Name? Tom, if I ever could, I would love to meet Tom. <laughs> I would love to ask Tom, am I right about this? Am I right that it was Tila Tequila? Because now, evidently, she's like a neo-Nazi. So it's really <laughs> weird. <laughs> it's an internet thing, man. It's an internet thing. This is like, the, these, are the, these are those stories, these internet stories that like later on, you know, they become documentaries like Tickled. Mm -hmm. I remember that. I remember that, actually. On <laughs> AOL, totally remember that. I was on AOL at the time. So, like, uh, wow, we, we, we went off w way big on my first ask. <laughs> Sorry. So my second ask is actually, I, I was looking at your LinkedIn profile, and I saw oh, that gosh. you... I haven't like, touched it in so long. <laughs> <laughs> like, more than 10 years ago, you worked at CNN. Now, that's What's a huge thing? company. Even ten, more than 10 years ago, it was a huge yes. company. But I want to know, like, what your thoughts on... Like, do you think from behind the scenes that their culture has changed? In I, I quit. I quit. You actually. quit. Yes. <laughs> so um, I was there with um, the founder, the former CEO, and I worked at the what's called the Strategic Integration Group. What that is is so every network has one. It's the department that integrates advertising with production. So if you're watching a sitcom and a character drinks Pepsi, that's yeah. strategic integration. Okay. In most networks, it's housed with production. At CNN, and I'm going to assume all other 24-hour news channels, it's also it's housed in, in advertising. And I was the I was the project manager there. So my job was essentially to help um, re, basically update, relaunch, redevelop, and relaunch their method of. This was my main task at their, at their um, of managing their inventory of uh, advertisements, like, like what ads were available. And you know I. My family, we, we owned a, my father started a newspaper in 1956. So we owned it till 96. So I, I grew up with ink on my fingers. I grew up with a lot of um, a love for journalism. I mean, news and all of that. And I was really psyched, you know, to, to work at CNN, even if my politics were true, you know, I'm, I've always been very much either an independent or very truly centrist. Like um, today, mm -hmm. today I'd probably be called alt-right, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> But also, you know, uh, my family coming from Eastern Europe, I've, I've always felt very strongly about the importance of all voices. You know, the news is, you know, journalism, free, you know, free, freedom of the press, all that stuff. With an awareness, too, that America has always had a yellow journalism problem. I mean, all the way back to John Adams. All the yeah, way, right? Definitely. Between <laughs> John Adams and Jefferson, it was the first example, really, of it. And so it's nothing new. My problem at CNN was not really the wasn't the politics because what what I found there and this has not changed in my opinion it's actually only gotten much worse is so you know I don't I don't know really I don't I don't know anyone there anymore so I don't have much of a problem talking about this anymore the reason I left was um, there was a uh, you know when you how do I explain this quickly so if you pick up a magazine you'll see that the if there's an ad on the back page like on the very back of it and also when you open it up, the first left image, like the left, like first open it on the left, those are the two most valuable spaces in a magazine. Like, so we're talking uh, by cost, we're it, it, incredibly higher for say a full page ad there than anywhere else. The equivalent of that in, at least then in, in news was the moment just before a segment and just after that block was the most mm -hmm. valuable. Yeah. Space. Basically, if you think about it, if you're fast forwarding through, you know, DVRing through ads, the ones you're going to most likely hit are just before and just after. So mm -hmm. when you look, it's a nice, it's a little interesting tidbit. If you want to have a, a little sense of something, watch, which the only time whenever I watch the news, the only thing I tend to watch for is that. 
who, who's advertising in the segment, who's advertising right before and who, right after in the segment. Who's the bookends. Right. Yes. And the reason being is I experienced just how much influence the advertiser has. And so what had happened was, is, um, so this is 2008. I had never lived um, outside the Northeast. And so I had never experienced forest fires. And there was a forest fire in San Diego. And it was, you know, 24 hours. We have, you know, CNN on the you know, news there. And it looked huge. It looked like, you know, it looked like the Paradise Fire that, you know, was a few years ago. And a friend of mine had just moved to San Diego. So I was worried. And I called him. I said, are you all right? He says, well, I don't know what's going on over there. It's about 10 acres. It's like, 10 acres? <laughs> And, you know, forest fires, there's a natural, in nature, you know, forest fires are actually important. I mean, both for avoiding larger ones, but also in, there's some trees that don't even, they, they, they can't reproduce themselves without a fire. That's how they do it. And so I was really struck by this. And I grew up around hurricanes. And I know that not being honest about a natural disaster is very dangerous for reasons people don't usually think about. One of the biggest reasons is that the highest rate of injury tends to be when people are preparing, right? I mean, mm -hmm. obviously we can say something like Katrina or, you know, massive issues is different, but people in a panic will either, you know, there's, as we know from the last mm -hmm. two years, things happen, right? Yeah. And so I was really bewildered by it. Um, and at the time we were what you call like romancing, basically, um, British Petroleum, BP. Because we were giving them really, really, really cheap, good, that space. And I was working late and the other, another point, they were creating a, uh, a long form documentary called Planet in Peril with Anderson Cooper. So you can imagine what that was about, right? You know, mm, like, yeah, the world is coming to an end kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, it was one of those early, like, you know, um, you know, we were seeing, I think a lot of it now which came from this whole idea. But what came across our desk was a, I, somebody was sitting right next to me in this kind of uh, enclosed space. It was a guy who was uh, in ad sales. And I was, you know, in ad sales, I was like, I don't blame, their, their job is to sell. That's what they do. They don't have a, you know, they shouldn't, frankly, they shouldn't have an editorial opinion on this stuff. They just sell, right? Yeah. And this memo said, and it came from the CEO and it said, BP likes Planet in Peril. Push the San Diego forest fire and plug Planet in Peril. Meaning, Every time they would show the fire, they would do like a little ticker at the bottom, you know, planet in peril coming. Da, 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 da. And I saw that and I was just appalled. I was disgusted. Um, and I started saying it's weather porn. And I quit giving my two weeks notice. And I, I was, you know, I'd been hired to replace a guy who had been on mental health leave. And so there's a period in corporate policy that you have to wait. And so I was just about to sign, like I was just, I was going to be making good money. I mean, I don't think I've, Man, I haven't seen that that kind of money since, you know, <laughs> at all. It would be very nice right now. Um, and you know, there was some wonderful people I worked with, like people I really liked and I had a lot of respect for. That appalled me because it wasn't even. I, I was disgusted because it wasn't even about a political bias. It was pure cronyism. And I think that today. You know, back in February of 2020, I, I you could actually find this. I, I posted it publicly on my Facebook. Um, essentially, I said something like, I haven't fully flushed this out, but guys, I'm seeing virus porn because I could spot it. You know, I, I recognize it. I know mm -hmm. what it is. Yeah, uh, you recognize when the media is trying to blow something up. Well, and, and also when it's for advertising. I can see yeah. it, sniff it, right? And one of the things, you know, that's very clear is the impact that pharmaceutical ads have had on this crisis. Yeah. Right. And I'm, I'm speaking gently uh, <laughs> because, you know, that's one of the, 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 the sad truth is, is that almost no one is immune from that. And um, I'd say that, you know, the fact that the United States and New Zealand are the only two countries that allow pharmaceutical advertising says something. And my mother, this is interesting, has always been someone who said that there should be no pharmaceutical ads. And my argument to her was always it's a free speech issue that you should allow it. But I'm now starting to realize that there is, even if I'm a free speech absolutist, we still, I think, have to place the import of a human being's right to have freedom of speech. And there are, are you know, the, the difference between personhood and a human being. 
does that make sense? Like, you know, corporate corporations have personhood, right? Yes. But, you know, so it's not like, you know, we hold these, uh, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all corporations are created equal. <laughs> no. Right. It's, it's, you know, it's important that corporations, because they're made up of individuals and made up of people are not repressed by governments, but clearly it's not working out that way, is it? You know, um, and now the influence that's happening where, um, it's become such a monster, right? That, you know, when you watched, if you, if you watch right now, right now is actually a really good time to catch this because what's going on in China, right? With um, the new variant, supposedly, and uh, they're doing lockdowns again. If, if you're curious about something, I would, I haven't done this yet, but go turn on, say, MSNBC or CNN. CNN's a great example of it because um, even though they just changed CEOs again, I don't think this is going to change. Mm -hmm. um, they are beholden, I think. You know, and, and by the way, I'm steel manning this. I'm being generous about this. When you are in an industry that's basically, uh, you know, it doesn't even realize, but it's really on, it's on life support, right? Um, there's a lot of ways they could adjust and change their model and make it work, but they, I, these are the ad. Remember early days of the internet when when the ad world got involved and we had pop ups. Remember? Like, yeah. Right. I, I my very first job out of college was working at a working for a, a you know place called it was a it was a e-services, you know, new media company that was all started by ad guys from like Mark USA. Never again, never. <laughs> These people, are, I mean, they, they don't, half the time, they don't know what they're doing. They don't know anything about um, the tech that they're dealing with. They, it's like a, it's, it's sometimes how I look at meta. It's like people like, meta is good. Like, they don't even know what it is. They don't, they don't. <laughs> You know, and and in some level, normally that would mean that the market would normally adjust. But what's happening is, is that the one industry that can keep um, places like, you know, general, you know, the commercial based um, ad dollars and, and trust me on this and working in the strategic integration group, you have no idea how much the advertisers matter. Like there are events, there are there are shows, there's programs, there's big, you know, award things. They are not about the award. They are not about anything that you think as an audience member they're about there it's simply about whining and dining advertisers that's what it's for period like i mean there was this thing called cnn heroes i mean it was this big gala and it's all advertisers are there and handing out nanos and you know with cnn content I and mean, this is back when you know you know they're paying for this apple doesn't give anything on discount right and it was you know it's it's clear what it's about but if you think about the fact that pharmaceutical companies are the only ones that are making money that are able to put you know, millions of dollars into a, you know, at one time it was, you know, BP, right? <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> and so why do you think that we see so much coming from the green world or from, you know, like you, there's so much of it is because they're dependent on it. And then what happens is, is that, you know, so I made a tweet about this a while back. I said, why do you think that um, people can't criticize uh, some um, medications or, uh, you know, whatever. Um, why can't people, why can some be criticized and some can't? Well, it's because if you criticize, say, a uh, Pfizer product, you then better make sure that you're not criticizing a Johnson & Johnson or a Moderna, because you're going to need them. And then in six months, you might need Pfizer. And then six months, you might need, you know, uh, the next one. And, and, and it's, an, it's an endless thing. And so, oh, it's worse because it's true cronyism, because now the government is involved. Now the government is funding. Not only is not only are, are pharmaceutical companies, you know, paying for ad space, now the government with our tax dollars is are also funding and paying for what's essentially an ad, right? And it's, mm -hmm. uh, like great, there's that great uh, South Park episode, right? Where, you know, the ads, they're getting smarter. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, what, it's it makes think, what it makes me think of is this idea that um, like, uh, so, sort of like when Exxon, when, when the people were like, what do you make money off of? This whole idea of like, where is the money going? Where, like, what do you do? You know, the, the whole TPS reports thing from uh, that. Oh, yeah. Like, that's, that's you know, it's like, what do you do? What is, what is this used for? What do we do here? And it's like, it's essentially nothing. It's like right. spinning wheels 
to I make that money. Part of economics, I think that's what they call rent rent seeking, essentially, right? Mm. I think that's what it's called. That, that basically you don't produce anything, you don't make anything. Now, granted, CNN is supposed to provide news, but see, I'll, I'll add, it's gotten even worse in another way, which, um, in my opinion, is that we are now basically. Um, experiencing what CNN International always was. Because it was they were separate. So it's CNN International, CNN Airport, CNN Domestic, right? And mm -hmm. then some other breaks. And back then, when I was there, by the way, there was barely a digital presence at all. In 2008, almost nothing. People can't, I mean, you and I were old enough that like 2008 is like yesterday, right? <laughs> but, but so, you know, it's, it's, the difference now is massive. And so I can't speak much on the digital space, but I can tell you the amount of what I would call virus porn um, has been horrifying like um it's i have not watched passively um a, a network news channel since february 2020 i haven't mm -hmm. had it on like unless and and this is something that if, if if there's anything that people can do for themselves i would suggest do not put on the news in, as background don't do it <laughs> oh hell no do, do not do it at all and, and if you can get your family to stop too if you could sit and watch it engaged and know what you're watching and be engaged with it. It's a different thing. Well, but because then you're, you're thinking about it. It's rhetorical. It's not just a consumption washing your brain with right. their. Well, it's fear. I mean, that's, yeah. what, that's really what it like. I mean, like I remember when I was working there, I would walk out being like, Oh my God, the world is coming to an end. Cause it's, you know, 24 hours having CNN just airing over and over and over again. Um, and you know, <sighs> So often, you'll also, I've now noticed, I mean, there's a, actually a really good podcast that, that, that deconstructs this actually is uh, No Agenda with Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak. I, I highly recommend it. It's fantastic. It's only, I actually have been listening to it since like January of 2021, before that a little. And they, they're able to deconstruct and point things out, which they do a very, very, very good job of it. But the amount of stuff that's actually paid for is shocking. Like when you start to see it, you can't unsee it. Yeah. And, um... So no, it's not, it's not gotten better. It's gotten worse. And we're now, I think that something shifted that all of the stuff that, you know, CNN was basically media for hire internationally. It's what it was. Now that's what it is here as well. And I, and I'm not only speaking, I'm, I'm Fox, MSNBC, all, and something is going on at MSNBC. I don't even know what's going on over there. Like that, I, it's almost, but. Well, I mean, it's, it's owned by Gates. So. Well, yeah, but still, it's been owned by Gates for a while, but something's <laughs> happened where, I mean, I'm sitting there watching and I'm like, did they just claim that Putin is worse than Hitler? Like, <laughs> um, I'm like, proof that Jews don't own the media. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, you know, just putting that out there, you know, try it. Um, <laughs> like, all right, but thank you. Sorry, follow Jews, you know. Wait, wait, oh, of course, of course we do. Yes, we do. No, we don't. <laughs> now you're making me think of the South Park episode where it's like, I know you have gold, Kyle. <laughs> do you remember that one? Exactly. Like, yes. I, 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 wish I, I wish I had gold. Right now, yeah. especially. Um, yeah. But, um, you know, well, that's another thing. The Russians have gold now. So, you know, come on. Yeah. Uh, but no, so, so honestly, it's much worse. Um, and it's actually one of the things that... Um, you know what, this is, when we discuss censorship, this is one of the things that I'm really bewildered by because, you know, I don't know how we got to a point where we are being censored by the very institutions and people who have benefited and gained the most from our um, liberties and, 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 and natural rights, whether it's from universities to, uh, you know, media. And I mean, listen, this is not the first time this has happened. This is how it, it's happened before in history. And I think that it's, um, it's frightening, it's terrifying. Um, and, you know, it's something where, you know, censorship, it's interesting. My mother, who's Hungarian, who lost her father in, to uh, in the gulag, she will say after everything she's ever been through that there is nothing worse than censorship, nothing. And that's, Intense. It's an intense thing. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, first of all, I just con commend you for talking, making a, a, a you know channel focused on this because I don't think people really have understood yet, and and maybe I hope it won't have to come to a place where you know like 
you know, IY and, you know, the artists in China or, you know, Solzhenitsyn, what it, what it got for them when they suddenly realized what has happened. But it's I, yeah. starting to happen very, I mean, it's very quick. Like, I think that it we're, is. the, um, Sorry, so does that answer your question about CNN? I, yes, it does. It does. I, I, but I, I do want to say that I, I, one of the reasons why I started this show um, is because of the fact that most people have this weird idea about censorship that they believe it, it only is censorship if it's coming from the government, no. which is a really, it's like, that's, that's when you're talking about in the U.S. specifically a First Amendment violation. But censorship is a larger saying any private entity can do that yeah any any organization can do that to anybody yes. um and i i i agree with you that the this idea that these these large organizations that built themselves on be on free expression essentially like academic freedom in uh in uh academia uh the freedom of the press for most of these giant media to the point where I mean, historically speaking i mean uh, you know, under John Adams and Jeffrey, I mean, John Adams actually, uh, you know, he he shut down free press at one point because he was so f frightened of the mob, right? <laughs> the yellow journalism. And if you look, right, it's a weird thing. We're seeing this now. Like we're seeing a very similar manifestation of what happened under, under you know, second presidency, right? And, um, you know, I would say that for certainly the government's always have a hand in censorship, I think. I think that they always, you know, whether we're dealing with like, remember the days of uh, uh, Tipper Gore, right? Oh, God. Yeah. <laughs> right? So, I mean, that, was, that, you know, but I mean, this is what blows my mind is that, you know, back then we had, you know, Tipper Gore and then we had all these artists coming in front of Congress and, and testifying about why this was, you know, appalling. And then of course the benefit that came from having the parental, you know, thing that always there was this weird, the, the human beings tended toward wanting to be able to express themselves. Like there's a, oh, I don't know if you heard this. It's one of the most, like my friend, Scott Ol um, Ullman, oh, Scott Ullman, who's a, he's, he's relatively recent on Twitter. He's one of the most brilliant people I know. He actually made a joke about this. He said that like for the most dystopic um, sentence of like ever heard in China, they were putting over loudspeakers to people who were opening their windows saying, you know, temper your soul's desire for freedom. Ugh, <laughs> that's terrifying. No, yeah, you know, and that, and that's a, that's a whole other level, but he, they're even there, they're touching on something that is very true. We desire, we have a natural inclination, not everyone granted, True. I think that there's some people who, who desire, uh, some people are very uncomfortable with the, with the chaos and, and, I, you know, I call it, uh, I say they're, they're people who want someone else to think for them that that's painful to have to consider how to be a good human being. It's easier if someone else tells them what to do. <laughs> I know we talked about the fetishization of this too. I do think there's a level of that, a very high level of that where there, there's this great meme, um, uh, I can pull it up if you want, but it's, uh, you know, the, from Futurama, the guy in Futurama, and he's always, you know, looking around, like he looks, he's looking to his side and he says, uh, it, it, on it, I just love this. It says, I don't know whether you'd be a dominant or a submissive. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I think it's so funny is that there's half the times that I'm like, yeah, I don't know whether you're the person who puts the boot on the neck or you like having your boot on your neck. <laughs> and that's yeah. a ton of that right now too. I think there's some vicariousness to wanting the government to put the boot on your neck uh like they they, Some people they like to watch yeah yeah like like oh they makes them feel like if they support the idea of these people controlling others then they are they have more control over their own lives it's kind well, of gross i think it's even darker than that i'll be honest you know like like um i hate to say uh you know i used to be a very optimistic um you know loving people person and i think that there's a certain level when you love people the only way you can it's like you can't help but become a misanthrope if you love them to a degree. <laughs> yeah um, and i and i and i say this with sadness but um i never thought that i would see things that um you know i you know i don't know if we're, we're gonna get into this but like you know my family coming from you know eastern europe and i've been gone to romania under the communists and hearing stories from my mom and actually even being the child of somebody of watching her over, you know, decades 
come out of it. Like there's even moments when I've still to this day will see the way that she was like, there's, you know, stuff relating to Mao, for example, like the brain, the little depth of the brainwashing that happens and the, this is so horrific. But the worst part is this realization that, you know, Eugene Ionescu, I think says it best, and I'm just going to quote him if that's okay. Um, he says, um, the supreme trick of mass insanity is that it persuades you that the only abnormal person is the one who refuses to join in the madness of others, the one who tries mainly to resist. We will never understand totalitarianism if we do not understand that people rarely have the strength to be uncommon. And that is, I think that's, a, that's, that's something which, why everything seems to be happening so fast is because I think we have this presumption that natural rights and liberty and a love for it is automatic in most people and in most America, it's not. It's, it's what's being, feeling safe, being cared for, having a sort of parent, that's why communism is so ap appealing. It's this, you know, paternalism and, and maternalism that is a false paternalism, because trust me, they do not love you. <laughs> yeah. Ever. Like, I mean, and this is actually a really important point. I mean, the government period does not love you, but a government that doesn't leave you alone really doesn't love you. I mean, it's, it's it, it, all the stuff that comes across like, you know, love Trump's hate or I mean, it, to me, it, it sends chills down my body because I know that it's a lie. And I know that, you know, if they loved you, if, you know, they would, first of all, let you make mistakes and not have it ruin your life. They yeah. wouldn't, you know, it's, it's, it's like we're, we're, in, we're all in basically a abusive relationship with both our governments and our cities. And in my case, like that's why I live in New York. It's a mm -hmm. terrible thing. I mean, it's, it's really, really, really heartbreaking. I mean, I'm, I'm, I just had a conversation with a woman from Cuba, uh, two night, two days ago here. And she was almost in tears. She doesn't, you know, I, I gave her a hug and I just said, you know, I, re I, I reminded her that one of the best things about Cuban Americans is that they, uh, um, or even just, you know, Cubans who come here, they're one of the best pieces of advice that they ever give is just, you know, be happy. Like that's, it sounds a little silly, but it's the biggest that you can do <laughs> is just, you know, strive to be happy, you know, strive, keep pursuing happiness is really what they're saying. Keep it, keep going because that's, I mean, that's the worst part of this stuff is that you're not able, it's this idea that the government is going to make you happy. First of all, that's a low bar. <laughs> Being happy is a really low bar. It's, you know, it's the curiosity, the pursuit, the, the pursuit of happiness is what's, people don't know how rare that is. Like in the gaming world, like we're going back to that, it's a great segue back, right? you know, all that control, all that stuff of wanting, I don't think those girls are happy. Oh, no, I, I think this is, a lot of this is a misery loves company kind of situation, unfortunately. I and think you're being generous. Yeah, that is probably a little generous. I think some of it is a personality disorder. Uh, and abusive. Yeah, disaffected, by the way, is Josh Slocum from Disaffected oh, does yeah. a great job talk, covering this. And I think he's right. You know, I think he's we are dealing with a lot of people. Forth. Yeah, he and I have back and forth quite a bit about personality disorders because I do see, I saw it like, I want to say like sometime in 2020, I was like, oh my God, this is like, this this culture is like living with a uh, with a borderline personality oh, God. Disorder. Yes. everywhere. Yeah, <laughs> it it absolutely, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And it's it's and you know the misuse like calling everyone a narcissist. You're like like oh honey, you don't know what a narcissist is, or maybe you are one. Yeah, well, a lot of people just think that means an egoist or someone who who's into their looks, and it's like ah, that's kind of a like a a, a, a like so we all have watering down. People forget we all have a narcissism. That's not the issue, right? And our egos, you know, this idea, I think we, so I practiced Buddhism for a long time. And this idea of ego that's been, you know, like things like ego death, and it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a westernized version of what is actually being talked about in, in Buddhist concepts and Eastern and Dharma teachings. Your ego is necessary in, you know, for you to, to have the value of yourself as an individual, which is necessary, is-, is you know, some self-worth. <laughs> more than some. I mean, you, you can't yeah. you value anything else until you value yourself. Yeah. 
right? And, you know, this all, so communal narcissism, which is the thing that I think, and I, I would be curious what Josh would think of this, is that I think that that's the most prolific that we're seeing, and it's also viral. Like, it's, you know, it, this whole idea of, you know, the people who, um, you know, are, are, are on the right side of history, right? <laughs> But, uh, you know, treat you like crap. Like, I mean, as somebody who can't be vaccinated, I'll tell you, I've experienced it first. It's horrifying. Yeah, it's and terrible. I wanted to talk to you about that because I read your mm. carrot versus stick post where you you mentioned that you have an illness that prevents mm. you from being vaccinated, that your doctor told you not to do it, right. that he had evidence of other patients suffering. He had he patients who it did. And, you know, I, I've seen him a few times and, you know, in the last one, like in each one, he's in almost in tears. Oh, that's you know, and, terrible. And, well, I mean, listen, it's in New York. Um, it's bad, but you know, there's some places, for example, in like California, um, there are doctors who can't even give you. So I have a note from my, from my doctor. I can't even go grab it and read it. I saw it. it. It's, you have a picture of it on your post, uh, yeah. Yeah. Carrot versus stick. Uh, yeah. I saw it. Yeah. In the, in the newsletter. Yeah. Um, and it's also, it's, 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 um, and I called it carrot versus stick because Dr. Wen had basically said, you know, um, you know, if, if if we give people back there, so like, you know, what's the carrot going to be, you know? Yeah. Uh, and I'm just, I'm convinced. I mean, listen, this sounds a little, a little bit like I'm, I'm convinced she's kind of like Sirhan Sirhan that she's been like, mm, you know, mm. <laughs> so she the way her voice has changed and a lot, it's a little freaky to me. Um, <laughs> That's that's my that's my own little conspiratorial thing because I I, uh, I I I'm actually had a video on how to be self how to be hypnotized. I'm very hypnotizable. So um, <laughs> yeah, you want to hear that voice? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> well, yeah, I, so actually, once you know it, actually, you're able to, yeah. Yeah, able to control it. But um, yeah. it's, but it's you, so you you were like told essentially that you can't live no. anymore. Well, worse than that. I mean, I like so it's worse. Than, so basically, if I the, I have something called CRPS, which stands for Complex Radial Pain Syndrome. It came, so I had a, um, I can't pull my sleeve down, but I had a, a, um, a ulnar neuropathy, which is like your funny bone, right? So mm -hmm. I had a, uh, uh, basically my, the ulnar nerve, which is the funny bone, um, it was getting constricted. So I couldn't move or feel my ring finger or my pinky. And then they started to kind of curl in. And so I had a very small incision, like you, I don't know if you can even see it, like really it's a little light colored here, but you actually can see how this is a, see that's a different color right there. Yeah. That's actually um, one of the symptoms that you, from CRPS. So what, what it basically is, is that it's a very rare disorder that was triggered by this surgery that I had. It was a very, surgery went very well. Um, usually vulnerable, they cut you from here to here and then transpose the nerve. Mine was a little small, small incision. They removed the constriction. And it went great. And then one day, um, same day, actually, I was very lucky in this. The same day I'm going to see the surgeon, I go to pick up a pot and I feel razor blades cutting through my like through my hand. And I was like, drop the pot and looking at it, trying to figure out what the heck cut me. And then I, I'm not bleeding. And I'm like, well, that's odd. But I figured it's the nerve healing, right? So I go to see him. And it, as a sort of, as we're all, he's done looking at it, I kind of just tell him, oh, by the way. And this doctor was like, you know, he made Dr. House look like warm and fuzzy. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> a lot of surgeons are like that, you know, they love to cut. Um, <laughs> so he immediately tells me, you know, go to pain management, do not to pass go, do not. And, and this is, you know, people I don't think understand that now I know something, you know, not all pain management is opioids and not all pain management should happen post pain. Like sometimes you do these things before. Now, I've learned this. And so the head of pain management, at, um, it's a very well-known hospital in, uh, uh, I'm just out of respect for him because I don't want him to have any problems, um, mm -hmm. is uh, my doctor. And, you know, I go there and they diagnose me with this and they say, we have good news and bad news um, and a request. You know, bad news is you have CRPS. Good news is we caught it really early. Request is don't look it up until we're done treating you. So, you know, I had a series of nerve blocks where they put like a needle about this long, like into my neck. I mean, it was, it was crazy. But it's on the McGill pain index, there's nothing more painful. And so nerve pain cannot be treated with medication. There's nothing that stops it. And there's no rhythm to nerve pain. And it also, it makes you feel kind of crazy because I would, I'll feel things like, I would feel like a hot poker going into my arm or I'll feel like, um, for me, it's actually, it, it travels. So it's only on my left side, thank goodness, because if it switches sides, that's a really bad sign. But um, it's on my left foot as well. So like if I'm ever having 
symptoms are if I hit it in a strange way, my, my foot will swell up to be look like a hobbit foot. Um, but so what it really is, is the body just reacts. It's a, it's a, it's kind of a neurological because the nerve is connected to your neurology. And for some reason, you know, I couldn't get the HPV vaccine either. And I knew that because there were cases of CRPS that came up. And, and when you're dealing with CRPS, if there's just a few, that's enough to make a risk reward ratio that if like, if there's any chance that you are not going to die from something without the vaccine, then you don't want it. It's that simple because it's not just death. The experience is it's the most painful thing on the McGill pain. There's nothing more painful. So amputation, like birth, childbirth, in, uh, cancer, nothing. And I experienced it for about a year. And I'll tell you, it's known as this colloquially as a suicide disease for good reason. It sucks. Like it's horrifyingly painful. And I'm very lucky. But when he told me you can't do this, I mean, we're talking, we're looking at like chronic pain of magnitude for the rest of my life with bone deterioration, ligament deterioration, and like a one-way ticket to Oregon for euthanasia. That's what I'm looking at. If I, if I, if I, you know, if they, and he normally, if I, you know, cause I have this doctor, if the symptoms ever come, there's things we can do. The thing that he said that really terrified him is he says, I don't know what to do for people. That it's, that they've, he's had patients now who have their pain go from zero to 20 and he can't stop it. And it's, you know, for him to say that, and by the way, you know, he's vaccinated, you know, he's, he's also Romanian and he, you know, he's saying, you know, we're overdoing it. Like we went from one extreme to another and it's true. The fact that we are dealing, you know, I, I, I still to this day cannot believe that I'm living in a world where I had people telling me that if I wanted to function in society, that I had to hurt myself. And then people see even saying, oh, get a second opinion. I'm like, I said this to my daughter. I was like, from who? I'm like, exactly. I don't know who from who. You know, and, and it's, it's, this, it's a cruelty. It's like this idea that, you know, and this I think relates honestly to even censorship because an absolutist, radical, collectivist mindset where the autonomy of the individual doesn't... I, I, wrote, I said this when I explained this in a, in a Twitter thread about what was going on with me. I said that, you know, I know what it's like to be around people who don't believe in individual autonomy. They don't believe in human consciousness at all. It's to them, it's like the to tooth fairy. We're talking to an atheist about the soul. They don't think it exists. And therefore, th anything, any reason that you have to not do what is considered for the greater good is basically considered trivial, period, full stop. And so then I, you know, then you become trivial and then liberty of the mind becomes trivial. It's just, it's, it's the one way that I've now even understood, now if, you know, my body, my choice stuff, right? You know, mm -hmm. I will say that I've always been pro-choice, but anti-abortion. I've always felt that it was something that should speak to a woman, a woman or a doctor, leave me out of it or leave people out of it. One thing I will say is that this whole experience has given me another perspective where I even understand why it's important to have discussions that are not even extreme to like people who are, you know, I have, I have a lot of respect for people who are pro-life. I understand their perspective and I, I admire it, but it's a, there's a problem in which you're, you, again, you're, you're choosing the autonomy of one individual over the autonomy of another individual. And when, how, where is that line happened? And more than ever, I've started to become a autonomy of the individuals than your body, almost as absolutist as I am is with censorship because at least for a discussion, it's not a, again, it's not a binary issue. It's, it's not, but I'll tell you to be somebody who's been, I mean, I don't even know how to put this. It's horrifying. Like, um, it's, it, I know people who simply don't want it. And that, and that's pretty horrifying too, to be told that you have to have an injection when you, I mean, I'm sorry, it's very rapey. It really is. Yeah. I, like, I know. Like I, Holly Mathnerd has said that made that a, a Analogy many times. Look, the whole thing is even the, the swab, how deep that was going. I mean, the whole thing, everything about this whole thing has been so unnecessarily. I mean, look, I had a needle this long put into my neck repeatedly. Now, this is something you know. When, whenever you're doing something like this to your body, they you there's a level of respect and 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 consideration and fear and. That's 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 treated as normal, right? The uh, look at the way that even you know needles in arms, like boots on the ground. <laughs> I'm sorry, when did I become a mil? When did I join the army? 
you know, the, the language used. And, and again, talking about censorship, I'm never going to tell people not to use that language, but I am going to tell them, pay attention to the language used, you know, have the right ability to say that's crazy language. That's nuts. You know, the, the way we're talking about things. So it's, it's a tricky, you know, censorship and freedom of speech is never, if it was easy, everybody would do it. Right. Yeah, <laughs> definitely. But because of this, like they were telling you that you can't, I couldn't do your life. You can't, okay. you're, you're, because you have not put yourself in the Because I didn't take the vaccine into my life. Um, yeah. you know, <laughs> that a, does sound like The mRNA is my Lord and Savior. Um, <laughs> I, uh, you know, uh, you know, Fauci willing. Um, I, um, so you, so you, you're escaping New York and I saw the poster yeah. and it made me laugh. Um, where you put your face over the Shout out to my friend Todd Ryan for putting that together. Todd Thorpe for making that poster for me. Yeah, it's nice. Um, so I get I get so you're trying to leave New York. You're leaving New oh. York, you're going to St. Petersburg. I hate um, it. Listen, I love I love that I have the chance, but I'll tell you I'm, I'm completely heartbroken about it. Well yeah, um I that makes sense. I mean, especially with your theater background. Oh, yeah. Wait, if you're talking about theater in the US, that's that's New York. Like well, I was. Really? I mean, look, it's <laughs> I mean, well, I will say this is that, you know, there's, if we talk about the theater stuff, I mean, I will get, it's, it's the thing that I'm, I'm, I don't know if you can see how angry I am. I'm, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so angry about it that I can barely, um, I'll say that one of the things that's the most disturbing is, you know, they lifted up the mandates in um, New York. Now I'll tell you that I'm so appalled that it took that to get people to come, you know, to realize it. So, I mean, as this is starting up again and it's going to start up again, Non-compliance is the only answer. Nobody has the right to tell you that you're, you know, we're born free. This is, take it from anybody who, anyone who's come from that world. It's time, I mean, I, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use one of those quotes, like, it's time to listen, right? You have to, <laughs> these people know what they're talking about. And the fact that we had to wait for permission to unmask our children or wait for permission to be able to go to a restaurant, like, a, no, 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 no. That's like saying... I'm going to wait for permission from my abuser to not be hit, that, that it's mm -hmm. that irrational. And so I'll tell you, I'll say that, you know, I was unpersoned beginning in September. And so um, until the mandates were lifted, I, I hadn't even, I couldn't, I couldn't go to a restaurant. I couldn't go to a museum. I, I you know, they, they had these rules of like equal, uh, equal accommodation, which was absurd. And the language of it, it, it reads right out of freaking Lenin. It's, it's terrible but there's no way to give me equal accommodation to a Broadway show or equal accommodation. I, mean, I, I was, I'm still waiting for them to send me a hopper painting to my you know, home. Um, but there's the point of it really. And I felt it, you know, is that you, my crime is being non-compliant. That's my crime. And they want to separate people who are non-compliant from the rest of society. And it may sound extreme, but I'm telling you, it's, it's, you disappear. Like I disappeared. And so I, I remember once I went to a, this was probably the worst. This was probably the moment that I re realized I was going to probably have to leave. Like, and, and I was fighting for my city and I still plan to fight for my city because it's not going to stop there, by the way. Like that's no. something that people need to understand that, you know, people will say, Oh, you voted for this. No, we did not. I did not. And if we're going to play that game, then you just sound like everybody else saying that everything should be based on democ democratic majority decisions. So, no, that's immoral and that's cruel and stop it because mm -hmm. I guarantee you it's going to hit you sometime. Like none of us who voted, you know, didn't vote for Biden. Are we to blame for what's happening now? <laughs> How about the people who did but regret it? It's we're beyond we're more than our country is more than that. Our people, people, I think human beings are more than that. But I was invited to go to a um, swing dancing class and I'm not a, I'm not a dancer, but I, I trained in a lot of movement and I love, I missed just doing something creative and out of my head. And, and just, I missed being touched, you know, all of that stuff. Mm -hmm. And um, the person who invited me, I asked him, you know, is it okay that I'm not vaccinated? And they didn't answer. Not, not this was not, by the way, this was the person who invited me. It's not their fault at all. And, um, I get there and we, you know, take 20 minutes to rehearse together and practice. And he's showing me some of the you know, steps and I'm having so much fun. And we walk into the class and the guy says, you know, uh, vaccine card. 
And I say, you know, I, I don't have one because just whatever you have. And I hand in my letter and the number of times I've done this and it's just ridiculous. So it takes the time and they read it. And this is the worst part. They read it and it doesn't matter. And so this guy starts screaming at me. And also it was weird, like he was screaming and apologizing at the same time. And I could see that it, they were feeling badly about it, but at the same time, they were like, you know, uh, it says vaccinated only, vaccinated only. I told you, I, I'm sorry, vaccinated only. And I just, I, I, I tried to take a breath and have some grace and I just excused myself. And I walk out all by myself. Nobody leaves the class either. I couldn't believe that nobody stood with me and I'm walking out. And just before, I mean, I was so excited. I was like, I felt like Cinderella, you know, I missed it. I was so excited. And I get out on the street and I'm sitting there and I'm like, this is the point because how many times now I'm eventually gonna stop trying. When you stop trying, nobody knows we exist. And then we just become this stereotype. And, and, and I mean, the level of bigotry, I can't even begin to like explain and, and the cruelty. I mean, there's one person who pops into my head immediately. There's one woman who I admired this woman. I still I have a thing she wrote in my notes because I thought she was that brilliant years ago. I met her at a reason event. <laughs> Yeah, okay. God. okay. And she was this woman that I admired. I looked at me, she was edgy and she had like done this like amazing life and she had done all this stuff that I, I you know, I thought she was gutsy. And next thing I know, she's calling me a parasite. And like, I couldn't, I couldn't get through to her. Like I tried. I mean, at first she didn't know she was talking about me. And then I tell her, I'm not fact, she, you know, blocks me on all social media. I call her and I leave a message saying, listen, can we go get some coffee? Because I'm, you know, I'm actually scared, but she says to me something like, and you know, she doesn't call me back, but she says in a message before she blocks me on Facebook, she says, uh, don't worry, once 90% of people are vaccinated, it's not gonna be a problem for you. You know, and I'm like, well, what, okay. Um, and then she blocks me everywhere and she continues to using that brilliant writing style she has to, to say that all people who are not vaccinated, all of them are parasites and she has nothing to do with us. And the analogy she made, and this was really deeply disturbing. She's not Jewish and she knows I am. And I was trying to tell her this is before she knew that I wasn't. I just was saying, you know, this is, not, we're, no, we're not. <laughs> um, and I said, no, you know, this word anti-vax doesn't, I mean, calling me anti-vax is like calling, you know, me with someone with a peanut allergy, anti-lagoon. I mean, it makes no sense, right? And, yeah. then, um, and she basically said, you know, well, you know, they're all the same, you know, all anti-vaxxers are the same. And you know, there's different levels of anti-vaxxer. There's the, you know, she starts doing this gradation. And then one of them, she says, this, you know, somebody holding a, a, a sign that says, you know, you know, an anti-Semitic slogan, you know, is an anti-Semite. It's a little harder to spot them when they're not holding a sign. I'm like, what? Are you kidding? <laughs> and yet she's using the term parasite, which was a term that was used by the Nazis to describe Jews. And so, I never experienced anything like, I've never experienced before in my life something where by my immutable characteristics, like something that I was born, I can't control, that I'm made worse than less than. I was dehumanized and I, I became, I mean, to this day, I'm truly, I, I'm actually afraid. So, you know, in New York, I'm actually afraid that something will eventually happen where I will be, you know, maybe there's a level of irrationality to this, but that I would be forcibly vaccinated. God help me if I went to an emergency room. And, you know, and I didn't know what they would do. I mean, look, this happened, you know, historically, there's a great analogy between this and the, um, um, what's it called? Uh, uh, where they were trying, they, they were uh, making infertile, uh, eugenics. Oh, eugenics, eugenics yes. Right. So there was a woman, um, this is actually in the Holmes verdict, um, where they found that they use this language, which is they bring up that if you can vaccinate somebody or, if, you know, if you sorry, if you can, if you cut somebody's fallopian tubes, you can forcibly vaccinate them. Like that's basically what the language of the of, of in the Supreme Court ruling said, and it's it needs updating clearly. Yeah, I yeah. I have heard of that and heard that people argue that, and that is a terrible fucking finding. Well, it's it's really funny when you realize, especially for women, right? Like, I have I'm a guys girl like you. I'm a geek. I love gaming. All that stuff. Or I loved it. I mean, you know. I have never been more acutely aware of the difference for us um, than I am now. And in, in it's, in it's, I don't like it. I think I would really rather go back in time. But, you know, the, the eugenics movement, you know, there was a woman who she was, um, 
she was she was not an imbecile as they called it right she was a member of like high society and she went in for a, 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 to have her appendix removed an emergency and while that was being done they cut out her fallopian tubes and she finds this out when she comes to and she sues you know she brings it to the court her mom did it and the ruling is is that because she was dating black men that clearly even though she was not an imbecile you know obviously she shouldn't be procreating right that's so yeah, yeah exactly horrible. but then when you take it even further in 1978 there were a group of mexican american women might have just been immigrants actually in california who were made infertile and the ruling came by the court in 1978 i was born in 1978 that stated they found they sided with the doctors saying that the doctors were well intended for the greater good and that any problems is or cu cultural because oh, of two God. Things. so this is not something that's that's this is not this is not ancient history you know no and, and all of this stuff that we're dealing with censorship i mean i feel like we're repeating the wilsonian era in so many ways and that is one of the places in the times i think that censorship not just by the government but enforced by institutions really got going and it's all related. And I think that um, we're really in big trouble if we don't start to recognize that and realize even that it's a form of censorship, like demanding that I be vaccinated before I can go to the theater or, or even the masking thing at this point, for sure. That's, that's, I mean, I'm sorry. If anyone thinks that doing something like this isn't like, okay, Anyone who tells you that that's has a zero cost is either lying or has a neurological problem. <laughs> or, yeah. an problem. or I don't know whether you're the Dom or the sub. <laughs> I love that meme, man. Hmm. So I, you, you brought up the fact that you're Jewish and I know you've said this before that, uh, and there's a lot of this going on where people are like, oh, comparing this person to Hitler or that person, you know, like, oh, this is going to be like the Holocaust. And then yeah. on the other side, no, you can never, ever compare anything to the Holocaust. Or ever in ways that make no sense. Like, yeah. Like you so make like yeah. you say, is it never forget or never compare? And I think that is a, a very important point because yeah. you you believe in free speech, but there's this idea that these people are trying to censor someone for ever bringing up the Holocaust. Now, can you explain to my audience a bit what that is about? Sure. So, you know, so a little very quick family background so people understand, you know, my, my mother's side of the family, we're Austro-Hungarian. My, my, my grandfather was nobility. We're Jewish. I'm Jewish on both sides. Um, my grandfather was a Hussar. And so, you know, they, you know, the Austro, the Hungarian, Hungarian Jews were a little bit different. We were very much integrated not and 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 less um we were still jews were still very much jewish and hungry in some in, in some ways that in germany they were even more just kind of like very act you know like, some people say they were less you know expressive of their of their traditions i don't really know but i know that it's just always sort of been that way in hungary um and so um you know if you ask most hungarian jews we will say that ethnically we are hungarians we're not ethnic i don't consider myself an ethnic i don't even know what that means i really don't know what that means um i'm but it's my religion it's my spirituality it's it would be like saying that my ethnic it's like my being white is my is my spiritual what i don't <laughs> you know so some people say that now and then they're a little freaky um <laughs> say mildly but um so you know we my family escaped hitler by fleeing to romania because there and, and my grandfather was very wealthy, so he was able to pay off the Nazis in Romania. You know, it was a, like they had their own train, I and mean, it was a very different world. Um, and then um, he was taken by Stalin and put into what was called the a Gulag, first it was called the Black Valley. And um, shout out to Martyr Maid for being the first person I'd ever heard, other than my mother, say the words Black Valley. It was pretty emotional to hear that in his Anti-Humans podcast, which was amazing, by the way. Um, very t tough to listen to. And then he spent some time in either in or the equivalent of something like prestige prison, which was a, an experiment where they wanted to prove that you human beings had no, there was nothing to a human being basically that, you know, we were just like, you know, reactions in, in all nature, not in, all nurture, not nature. And um, mm -hmm. then he spent, so he spent 10 years in total and he died in the black Valley. He was put back in the black Valley and that's where he died. So I say this because 
I have not been brought up with, you know, a lot of Jews who lost a lot of people. I mean, my mother's side of the family, we lost no one. You know, um, I mean, no one directly. You know, my great aunt was in is was in Auschwitz. A lot of Hungarians, you know, close probably cousins and things we did because Hungarians, it was like 300,000 were killed in three weeks. That said, I'm saying this because I understand how emotional the stuff gets for people. And I feel that way very much about Stalin um, and the hundreds of millions who have died under, commun uh, under you know, radical collectivism and, and Bolshevism. That all said, it is to tell someone especially if they are a survivor, for example. And, and many, we don't have many left that are alive. You know, there's very, there's a one woman, her name is Vera. She's an Auschwitz survivor who she's been one of the first to point out how similar this stuff is to what led up to the gassing and murder, sorry, or shooting, gassing, burning of millions of Jews and, and others. But these things don't happen overnight. There's this weird belief that something happens like that. And it doesn't. And that was one of the biggest lessons that's supposed to be kind of come from the Holocaust and from all other mass, you know, genocides and democides, um, which is, a, you know, just mass killing by government, not for ethnic or religious reasons, which is, by the way, much more common than genocide. And we never hear it, but democides have killed millions and millions more people than genocide has. And so when people say that, the creating of so like so i have a friend who's in germany she's jewish and she says that you know one of the things her her grandmother would always talk to her about because you know her birthday just passed april 1st and april 1st was the date when the um german government uh, boycotted all jewish owned businesses and she says that that was the day that it all began that was the day that you, there was no turning back and he, she would kiss her on the forehead every April 1st because it's also her birthday and apologize to her and say, you know, I'm so sorry that we did not stop this because they, she, they're of the opinion and she expressed, expressed this to me that the Nazis that were tried and all of this never again stuff was really a way of, you know, having some people punished, but that it never stopped. It never really stopped. And this is something that they felt. And, and you know, a Jew, if a Jew in Germany says, uh, hello, wait, 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 this is familiar. Like, this is what's happened, careful. And they're censored for that. Or I get really angry when fellow Jews will say, it's, you know, you never compare anything to the Holocaust. Wait a minute. So, so how much, are we playing, are we paying pin the tail on the genocide then? Like how close does it have to get before we can say never again? Because it's never again, never forget, right? And in, in, and for Jews, never forgetting is actually a really big deal for us. We have a we have a tradition of that. You know, we tell a story over and over again. We say when somebody dies, may their memory be a blessing. And we say about somebody who's done a horrible thing, may their name be forgotten. That's a big deal. And so, when you've got people saying, you know, this stuff. Historically, we, we this is you know it's a hundred you know we're, we're almost approaching a hundred years later when this stuff began. People are not alive. The survivors of both Stalinism and you know the Nazis, which are just two forms of radical collectivism, right? Mm -hmm. And if we can't make those comparisons, I hate to say this, but I end up doubting either somebody's education or their or scarier yet their motives, because. I don't care what your background is. If you say that with venom and you don't respect the fact that somebody is afraid, like, look, I get that there's a, it's overused. Like, I mean, I've seen people say, you know, with all those comparisons between Trump and Hitler were ridiculous, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. Okay. But notice that for some comparisons, they're fine. So really what's happening is, is it's, a, it's a form of profiteering on pain. That's all it is. You're essentially saying to people that we, we're who we're the decision makers. We're the you know the revolting elite. You know they would call themselves a revolting elite, but we're the we're the you know we're the class that determines and decides what's what's appropriate and what's not. And we're saying that it's okay to call Trump Hitler, but it's not okay to bring up the comparisons between what happened to Jews starting in like 1938, 39, and what's going on now. 
that to me is unforgivable. It's it's um, because listen, we're you know we're you know if you're, as long as you're playing in you know mass genocide neighborhood, right? I don't care whether or not you've got all the tick all the boxes. At the end of the day, you know the banality of evil. Like Hannah Arendt, who wrote that, she was brilliant. In that lesson, the lesson is we are all the Nazis. We are all, all of us. Doesn't matter if you're Jewish. Doesn't matter if you're Muslim. Doesn't matter if you're, you know. It doesn't matter if you're Mother Teresa, all of us have the potential to be a Nazi. And if we don't recognize that or, or the equivalent therein of, of somebody mm -hmm. who will do, and I'm saying that I've, look, I, I know that it's a big thing to say this, but to have been basically not just, you know, just treated as if I'm less than a human being, how far away is that from you know, once you dehumanize, once you start, once you have the president of your country basically calling it a pandemic of the unvaccinated, that language is straight out of 1938. And then, but and, and how many times were we hearing the comparisons, you know, saying Trump was language, his language is rhetoric. Come on. I mean, are you <laughs> kidding me? Right? You know, and then now, of course, what's happening again? People have no problem claiming that what's going on in Ukraine and whatever your opinion of it aside, saying that Putin is either Hitler or Stalin is disingenuous. And again, you're either uneducated, basing it entirely on emotion, or I don't trust you for another reason. There's something else going on. And look, how, why, let's say he was terrible. I'm gonna just put this out there, play a play game here. Couldn't there be something else other than Hitler or Stalin? <laughs> why make the comparison if you I, it makes me almost feel like if you have to make that comparison it you're not able to make a you're not able to make a statement about what's so terrible because i'll tell you right now the comparisons when people say it's like this it's worse in some ways this is the truth it is much worse we're taking you know to say that you know fauci you know larry kramer called fauci eichmann right um, in a, an open letter to Anthony Fauci in 1988, I want to say. But that's just so you have a starting point. I'd say that what's gone on in these last two years has been its own horrific and history. I think we'll look back and say that this is going to have a whole other end. But, because one of the worst parts of these, these years is th it's like a hydra. There's not one thing that you point to and say, you know, if Fauci goes, then, you know, this all, and it, but the, the truth is it's never really been that way. Not really, not really. No. <laughs> and often when you get rid of the, so, I mean, I would say that Stalin and Hitler were kind of unusual, like maybe Genghis Khan. And there was, you know, a few other moments, right? You know, right. Um, maybe Woodrow Wilson. <laughs> I hate that guy. Sorry. <laughs> I have a t-shirt that says, I still blame Wilson. I have to get <laughs> They print it for myself. Oh, he's wor oh, he's the worst. He's really the worst, man. He's the worst. Um, but um, I mean, think about it. Like, we've got, you know, it, this never compare thing. You know, when we've got what's going on in China happening now, right? And I mean, even before that, organ trade, Uyghur, Uyghurs, you know, all of that. Never again has already happened, so we can't say that anymore. I mean, I think that's a um, that's the reality. We failed in that completely but never compare has led to and it's, it's by the way if you notice it's always people in power who say never make that comparison and half the time i think you know somebody said this on twitter was i can't remember who i who attributed it to they said if you don't like the if you don't like being compared stop doing things that are comparable <laughs> yeah and I think, you know, the, a lot of times the, re, the reaction people have is that. But look, I think part of it, too, is, is, is we've um, overused, like just what we see what's going on now with Ukraine, using these terms. I mean, I will tell you, as somebody who lost family and lost, or my family lost everything, just, I mean, I wouldn't be here if that hadn't happened. So, you know, I guess, thanks. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we, you, because nobody has remembered and nobody compares to stop really, most people have no idea what that was about. In fact, I've had argument, I had a recent argument, broke my heart, with a woman who's, you know, Jewish and Eastern European who was insisting that Putin was worse than Stalin or it's like Stalin and, and I didn't expect it. And it was really upsetting because 
you can't, I mean, the, the argument saying why Putin, it, it, then you don't know who Stalin was. You don't know what he did. And you don't know either that it's a really messed up thing to say when, and, and this is not defending Putin because I don't know enough to have an opinion on that. And plus, I don't like any leader of any country. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, I do like DeSantis right now. He's a free, you know, daddy DeSantis. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Daddy DeSantis. Somebody said that recently. I was like, I've never said that except anybody but my father, but it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the, the, the thing though is, is that even, even him, you know, it, it's, it's not just him, you know, it's, it's a, but he's done a lot, especially recently passing a bill so that nobody dies alone in the hospital or is alone. That's yeah, that was a great bill. Yeah. Uh, I, I actually cried for that one. Um, I've never had a bill make me cry. Um, <laughs> but you know, you, you know, with Stalin, it's, uh, Putin saying that what Putin is doing is Stalinism. You don't know what Stalinism is. You don't realize. I mean, Stalin put people like my grandfather in places like Pushtish prison, where they tortured them to prove that there's no such thing as a human, like humanity does not. And, and we're, the, in, we're living through a variation on it. The inmates become the tortures. And so if you don't get that, no wonder we're living through a period that's like Stalinism. No wonder that, you know, we don't need, we don't, the mandates can be lifted yet the people who are enforcing them and people who are putting them on are, are fellow New Yorkers. I mean, fellow artists, fellow New Yorkers. It's, it's, it's appalling, but that's how humans can be. And especially when you figure it out how to sort of push a certain button and then suddenly the inmates become the choice. Look at what goes on in censorship on social media, turning each other in. The way you said earlier that you think that people like living vicariously, it's worse than that. People like, some people like to hurt other people. It's just the way it is. And it's, um, <sighs> yeah. you know, I mean, this is, this is all incredibly dark and, um, but I mean, I feel like we're, we're either living in dark times or we're more aware of it. Um, uh, Both. I, a lot of the stuff that I think people are now aware of was already kind of going on. They just were not paying attention to the kind of things that were happening. But and it's but, mm -hmm. but, you know, when people used to say that, you know, like, call me this, call me that, this is a whole other level. This is a whole other level of what's going on. And, and I think that it's important. Like one of the people asked me, I want New York, for example, I'm just using an analogy here. When people say they want New York to, to be okay, my point is until New Yorkers start honestly facing what's going on, there, there's no way. It's like yeah. the same thing happened after 9-11 to us. We had to face it dead on and deal with it dead on and move forward. And you can't, like, so when we're talking about things like censorship, we have never seen this level. You know, part of it's technological, part of it's the global interaction, but at the same time, we've never seen this either. Mm. So there's two things happening at the same time. Two things that, you know, Stalin would have given his left leg to have access to this kind of technology. But he also would have, we have to remember that so long as we can do this, we're ahead of the game, and we're 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 it's it's so far from over. Once that's I the just, case. my my thought on this is that it, the we were the frog in the boiling pot. Not everyone was aware of the fact that we were in the pot. Well, and, I think, and they I think turned up the heat dramatically in the last two years. <laughs> but I think also though, I think that there's a level of it where, how do I put this? I don't think, I think we're always the frog in the pot. I think that it's as human beings and as society, I mean, what is it? Uh, Eugene, again, Eugene Inescu is somebody, like there's some amazing thinkers and dissidents from, from that era. They all talk about this. This isn't new in the sense that it's always there. It's when something happens though, that that's the moment where it's like, okay, like too far. And that even if the frogs are always, you know, you're always in the pot boiling a little bit, you know, you could just be having a nice balmy swim. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and that's okay. And there's a level of, you know, it's almost like a balancing act. Like there's, I'm not going to, I don't want to control the people who are controlling me either. That's this weird, like, like Liberty goes across the board, but you know, when people were saying, you know, why, you know, the, as we're trying to figure out the censorship stuff, like with the internet, I mean, if we don't adjust, I mean, I have a, I, in my opinion, I don't think anything really needs to change other than we just need to acknowledge the difference between human being and personhood. That's like the only thing I think really that needs to be done. But if we don't do that, if we don't start educating people about natural rights, you know, it's not very, it hasn't been around very long. You know, the idea of being, of, of, of natural rights is, 
couple hundred years and, and it's evolved. It's gotten, you know, we've had moments like, right. You know what I mean? Yeah. But so I don't think it's, I think it's important to say, in my opinion, that it's, it's not like this is, there was a time when, you know, when people would, I, I would often find myself saying, and this is, I mean, I look, this could be my own bias, right? You could be completely right. But I used to tell a story about, you know, how I always knew that we were okay because, you know, the, the thing about um, living under a totalitarian regime, um, which is different than, a, it's different than a dictatorship because it's it requires the compliance and the cooperation of the people. Um, and also a dictatorship wants your, a dictatorship wants your compliance. A totalitarian system wants all of you. It's, it's, it's different in that way too. And one of the ways that having all of you manifest is, um, I remember being a little kid and going to a playground, it was a mess. And, you know, I, I been to this playground a lot and I basically told all, you know, the kids were, the parents were all standing around and not doing anything. And I'm just like, you know, pay attention, pay attention. Like, you know, let's immediately and quickly, let's, let's clean it up. Is what I said. And nobody moved. <laughs> and it, 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 it was, I didn't know what was going on. I thought it was, I thought they just didn't want to play with me. I now understand they were afraid because they could have been accused of doing a, um, uh, organized thing. Um, and that it was someone else's job to clean it up. And you ever hear people say, oh, you, you, you've taken somebody's job because you cleaned up something in San Francisco, like the, the you know, mm -hmm. the mess. and they say that you just took somebody else's job. That's that mindset. That's that comes from that world. And that world, I saw people who had the capacity, like if they could, it's like, you have the thing you can do is right in front of you to improve your life and they don't do it. And this is more common in so many parts of the world than we know. And I used to always say that as long as we're not doing that, we're going to be okay. But look now, and this is why I think censorship is so insidious because it stops you from even before you, you don't even remember why you're stopping. You don't even like, it's called a um, Chinese called killing the chicken to scare the monkey, right? Mm -hmm. Do something to stop someone else. And, and that's, that's, that's the thing. And I think that there has always been elements of that, but the moment we started to think that, the moment we started putting party above person and principle, I think is when we went a very dark place. So I know that, um, so we're, we're on to the censorship specifically now, and you said on your YouTube channel that in your Dear Artist videos that they're not doing their jobs, which know. they're, now it, there's two sides to art. There's the art as a political act, and there's the art as the making something beautiful um, to I make someone. That, I they think can that, overlap, but I think like, that's. I think that. Um, I think that they are that all. How do I put this? I don't think art is inherently political. I think that's a. I think that's a myth created by political people. I think that. Um, I think art is inherently human, and human beings can be political. Okay, so I think that art can often be, because it's human, sometimes be political, but art art created shackled to politics, I think is a major problem. I think it's actually, it, it, there's a, it goes back to this belief in something called um, socialist realism, which was developed by Stalin um, to what he fight, what he called formalism. So if you can replace formalism now with words like colonialism, right? Mm -hmm. And so it really, this idea that everything, I mean, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use the own language, check your privilege if you think. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's you know, it, it, is a, it is actually truly a privilege when things are not, or it's a sign of, I mean, R Romania, for example, had an incredible artistic community. It was amazing. It was like there was a little Paris of Eastern Europe. And when the communists went in there, they took over everything because there was no communist party prior to Yalta. And Yalta, for those who don't know, you know, Yalta was signed between Stalin, Roosevelt and Kissinger. So this idea that we've uh, that we were innocent in this is, is mm -hmm. a totally bull bullshit. Um, and so, you know, my mom often says, if you want me to be mad at the Russians, should I be mad at the Americans, too? Right. So, I mean, part of me, is, um, <laughs> you know, but again, Roosevelt buddies with Wilson, hate Wilson. That's a, you know, it all goes back to Wilson, man. <laughs> Actually, have you I've ever heard the joke um, about the guy going back in time to kill Hitler? You ever heard this joke? No. 
So Guy, time traveler, he's ordered by his general to go back in time and kill Hitler. Goes back in time, can't find Hitler. He comes back and he says, you know, sir, I'm, I'm very sorry, terribly sorry. I, I, I tried. I, I could not find Hitler, but I did kill Woodrow Wilson. And the general says, who's Hitler? <laughs> Okay, <laughs> but when oh, you're yeah. saying when you're saying artists are not doing their job, do you mean they're not standing up for art? Um, I would say it's 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 much more insidious than that. Um, it's I'm going to try to explain this. Um, so it's difficult. Excuse me if I fumble through this, but when I talk to artists about this stuff, there's some things. I mean, I, I think you, you talked with Cecil, right? Mm -hmm. I'd love to even know what he would think of this. Um, so Cecil, if you're listening, I'd love to know what you think of this. Um, I know that Cecil went through some censorship stuff himself. Um, and, you know, the art, you know, so, so the a story that I often tell is there was a, um, an incredible artist named uh, Meyer Holt who was a contemporary of Stanislavski. Stanislavski is the, is the father of modern of theater, basically. Every actor and every theater thing that's trained is, is, is trained in a variation of Stanislavski's method. And his contemporary and also somebody who was much more famous than him at the time was a guy named Meyerhold. And he was um, very beloved. And he, is, I did a long thread about him um, showing how almost everything that we see today, modern performance, is based on Meyerhold. And I was, I know about him because of my experimental theater training was all uh, basically dominated by who Meyerhold was and his successors. And Meyerhold was a communist. He was pro-revolution. He was um, very much, you know, he was, you know, believed in, in, the, in the movement and all that. And this is, you know, prior to World War II, you know, this is just, you know, as Stalin was coming into power, he was still around. And, and Stalin wanted to create, basically made it so that it, the only kind of acceptable art, it was, it was not only him, it was a group of um, artists and intellectuals, which is, there's no such thing as a bottom-down revolution, by the way. They don't happen. Mm -hmm. A bottom-down, down, like, sorry, it's just bottom-up. Like, these are always yeah. done by the, you know, there's a, even in the language of the international from 22 and 23, you see them talk about a vanguard. Like, that's the truth. So this, there, this vanguard at the time believed that everything should be, all art should be for the party. All art should be political. This is an important correlation to why I, I take you know, some um, major, pro I have a major problem with people saying that it's either and or, or always. Like, I think that is a, that's left over, in my opinion, from so uh, socialist realism. And what Stalin did, which was, he was hunting something he called formalism. Formalism was any kind of art that was not socialist realism and that you know, symbolism, um, use of metaphor, use of things, you know, art, that was that was um, beautiful. Sometimes, you know, I would say art for art's sake, I think, is bunk. But beauty for beauty's sake, I think, is very true. We need, we, like Mary Oliver says, uh, we need beauty because it makes us yearn to be worthy of it, and that's something I think really true. And Meyerhold said, in a speech, he said, "In hunting formalism, you're destroying art." And from that point, his pretty much days later, his wife was murdered, stabbed. 20 some times her eyes gouged out kind of like a oh you want symbolism here i'll show you symbolism and then he was put into he was arrested put into it he was tortured um there's many letters that he actually wrote to the president you know in the communist party and everything because you know he was he was a communist and begging them to stop this and the letters all came out there was a mass release in 1995 of um stuff out of the soviet union and it's included in in that and they're really just a hor I mean, because he all of his work was based on the body, so his Stanislavski is kind of like head out. More Meyerhold and, and Grotowski is like body first instead of imagining like you know the, the, the stereotype of you know imagining you when your mom died and that it, it's like so if you want to be if you want to show grief you actually put it into your body first and then or you know you, from the body it goes out versus the mm -hmm. other way around. And he because he was so exquisite with his body. He writes about being tortured in in such a detail that you you couldn't only he could do that. And um, then he talks about how he's gonna you know confessing must be better than this death must be better than this. So he falsely confesses and dies by firing squad. Mm. And so when I say we're not doing our job, what I mean is first of all 
we should know from lessons of history what happens to artists. I mean, I mean, speaking selfishly and sort of so that, you know, artists are hurting other artists very much right now. And to me, that's, I think it's an equivalent in many ways of a priest molesting a child. Like I, I feel, to me, I really feel that. I mean, I, I know I recently, I, I, I haven't said this in public, but I was trying to figure out a way that's analogous because it, it, it rattles your faith in something to see, you know, it's one thing to be hurt, molested, harmed, and then have it be done by something that's, that is, that em is emblematic as well as something way beyond you. Right. Like the yeah, arts. What you mean, yeah. yeah. Right. So the arts is, you know, for, for all artists, you know, and, and for a lot of people who love the arts or various, or even if games are an art form, right. Which they are, there's something holy, Right, which is why I think a lot of people had such a problem with Gamergate because it it was sac. I mean, in a way, you could say it's sacrilegious. What happened, and what's happening now is too because we're seeing artists repeat some of the same mistakes from the past. But I would even dare say, and this is something that is tricky because I I've been thinking a lot about this. I think that there's a lot of people who are in the arts or who are in media or celebrities and stuff, but there's fewer people who are trained in it and trained in the history of artists and also trained in general and cause it's, it's a, it's a, look, it's like anything, right? There's certain things when you spend a lot of time with it, you, you, you learn about the history, you learn more, whether it's, you know, but who may not be performers or artists who may not have as much, who may not be in academia like I am. So there's, there's few of us who in some ways we have less to lose. Like I can say these things and it's not like I'm going to be kicked out of SAG. You know, I, I left acting cause I didn't want to be in SAG. Um, <laughs> But the, see, this is one of the problems, though, is that, you know, we were forgetting that, you know, in the past we had um, artists that were being repressed by, say, governments or by, you know, the church or, you know, all the now it's being done by administrators and unions. And there's there's really no difference except the politics of the day are saying that it should be acceptable. But, you know, I, I oftentimes say, like, it's like the, the Zeppelin song, Battle of Evermore. This is nothing new. This is something that's been going on forever. And when you look at the role artists have played, both positively and negatively in every single um, human atrocity throughout time that I can think of, there have been artists who it's, you know, they were the ones who sort of were playing this alchemy to speed things up and get them out of it. To solve a problem, it's like, you, you know, it's like what you throw on top that makes it happen faster, right? Mm -hmm. But that also happens in a negative way. And then also, there's a lot of things from, if we use the Nazis, for example, those uniforms, man. <laughs> yeah, those were awful. You know, they, they had the best uniforms. They still have had the best you know, uniforms. I mean, Otto von Bismarck, you know, he had the best. You know, World yeah. War One, really the best. Like those were mm -hmm. unbelievable. They, they were the first. But so I was, I actually wonder who designed those. That was actually be a really interesting thing to study who, who designed mm -hmm. them. But, um, you know, I will say that, you know, that's an unusual thing. For radical collectivists to have to look so gnarly, right? Because <laughs> um, usually they look like Mao, you know, um, or you know. Gosh. But um, but that's a normal part of this stuff too. This is something people don't realize. The moment you start to, and I why I think that's how you say his name. The 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 Chinese artist is it? It's A I. I'm so bad with spelling and names. It's A Y I Y. He was the one who talks about killing the chicken to scare the monkey, and censorship in China. And also, if you look at any existence of it you look at the kind of work that comes out of places that aren't don't have the kind of freedom why america has created so much creative both good and bad right when you are living under a system or you believe that everything is political bluntly the art sucks you start making really bad art i mean it, it's so much of it's either we have none or it's crap right now i mean there's a few things that are great but Almost everyone, I think, in the arts right now that I talk to, and, and we all feel it. It's it's um, it's 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 like living in a uh, like a desert sort of. Um, and then, and part of that, by the way, though, I will add, there's one other thing that I think is just sort of uh, that allowed all this to happen is a uh, woman, um, Fran Lebowitz, who is a, a she's a New York City kind of. Uh, uh, social commentator and, and she's a, you know, a photographer, I think as well. And um, I can't remember. Yeah, she must be. She has this incredible um, interview and it's only, I can only find it on Vimeo 
because it's very controversial. She talks about what happened um, after the HIV AIDS crisis in New York and that what she says is that we didn't just lose artists, we lost culture and audiences. And I think that we're right now in many ways experiencing the, it takes a while, I think, and why one of the reasons so many institutions have been captured and so many places that we trusted is that, and this is gonna sound really obnoxious, but you know, Bukowski, who wrote this poem called Genius of the Crowd, is right. You know, he says, beware the average man, the average woman, beware their love. Their love is average, seeks average. And, you know, then says, you know, unable to create art, they will not understand art. They will see their failure as creators only as a failure of the world. And then they will hate you. Like, there's this thing that these people are really, really, really good at is elevating and keeping in power mediocrity. And this sounds obnoxious, and I, and I know it sounds snotty, <laughs> but... Let's, you know, let's look at our government. I mean, let's look at who's in power right now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, look, like, look, if, seriously, I mean, if, if you told, if, you know, we keep wondering what happened to our statesmen, what happened to our leaders, what happened. Um, but I think that, that that is, that's part of it is losing that. But then on top of it all, censorship, I think, leads to ultimately that as well as so does cancel culture. You know, you forget. It's, um, I, and I've been I've been chatting away a lot, but uh, you know when there's time, I'll tell you there's a there's a thing where you know in, in Greek mythology talking about Nimazine, the, the goddess of, of memory, and she's the mother of all the muses. If you kill memory, you don't have muses. You don't have muses. You don't have heroes. If you have hero, you know muses. You don't have statesmen. And muses are not just like they don't just this idea in mythology of what they do. It's you know it's it it's all it all happens at the same time, and, and it's the job of artists. That's when I say we're not doing our job is. You know, there's a few, you know, there's, you know, there's some great, you know, I know that just some people were speaking at like Eric Clapton and, and you know, you know, I never thought, I never thought that I would live in an age where an, um, right said Fred was, was, was on Twitter or on social media, like putting down Bill Gates, the nineties part of me just went, ah! <laughs> <laughs> it's an amazing moment. It was like, yes, you know, <laughs> kind of, cause look, I mean, I used to be a PC person, but whatever you say, you know, Bill Gates has always been a jerk. You know, like, and he's like, dirty operator. Why are we listening to a guy who created DOS or used DOS to like telling us about medicine? That's like one of the stupidest things I've ever heard. You guys are a moron. Mm -hmm. anyway, like, okay. Well, we should bad. wrap up actually. But I, so final question. What advice do you have for people to combat censorship? I would say, um, First of all, read um, Alexander Solzhenitsyn's essay with Not By Lies. Um, not, I mean, I know there's a book out too, but the essay is very short. Um, and one of the things he says in there, and I think this is important, so I understand completely when people are afraid to speak. And look, I really get it. You know, when I was a kid with my grandmother in Romania, there were times where I said something on the phone and I knew then that when they turned off her heater, or hot water that it was because of something I said. And you don't forget that. And it, it you know, so that's when I say, you know, being wise about certain things. Like, I mean, I, I know somebody who, you know, you know, you, you, it's obviously, it's, it's a big deal, but there's, there's two parts to that answer is one is I would say, you don't have to be afraid. I mean, even if you're afraid of what to say, at least don't say what you don't believe. That's really important. And, and one of the reasons I say that's even more important right now is recently we've had this, I, and I've never seen anything like this, and this is actually really scared, it, this scares me a lot, especially in the artistic community, where people were being fired for not denouncing Putin. And then there were people that were saying, even in defending those people who were fired, saying, you know, well, you don't understand if they said something about Putin, they would be in danger. And I'm like, wait a minute, listen to yourself. The problem is that you are now punishing people for what they don't say. That is a whole other level. Like we saw that a little bit with BLM, we've seen it creep. And this is, you know, totalitarian creep. Once it starts, you've got to stop it. Like you can't keep waiting. No one else is going to, there's, this is one of the things in Live Not By Lies, he's in, it's incredible, he makes it clear. It will not stop. Nothing will happen by itself. It will not. And to, if you're sitting around waiting for it to happen by itself, you're going to, not be happy. And this is something that, you know, every totalitarian system, I mean, look, we, CCP has been in existence now for a hundred years. We're double that time, but they've got a hundred years on, you know, it's, it's, we could be looking at that if we don't stop complying. 
or at least do not say what you don't believe. And there's a great moment he says, you know, the lies are in everything, the lies cover everything, not with any help from me. So you don't, not, it's like complete and total non-participation in lies. So that means, you know, not repeating a slogan you don't agree with. I mean, and, and look, it's not, and he explains in there, it's not easy. None of this is easy. But as he says, it's a lot easier than losing your soul. And whether or not you believe in a soul, it's, it's this idea of losing your, liberty of the mind is the thing that is the most insidious, and it, and it goes. So the more you're afraid of saying something, you're, think about it like this. When you keep censoring yourself, new ideas, who you are, it changes you. It changes the world. Everything changes. And so finding some courage to you know, do that. And, and I'll tell you that um, he also explains, and this is a beautiful moment in there, that you're not alone. You know, you, you're not, you don't, you're not going to be out there by yourself. And there's a lot of people who are out there already. And there's artists like that. And this is the thing that I wish artists really understood and really was, were able to do. Because I understand why they're afraid. I mean, look, they have a lot, some of them have so much more to lose than I do. And I'll tell you, when, you're, when you have a passion and you're allowed to do what you love every day, to lose that, I mean, look, I don't know what got over, for example, I don't know what got into Will Smith's head when he did what he did, but whatever it was, there's something going on there. Because what he did was so careless because suddenly he's having other opportunities to do it is what you'd assume he loves, but that means there's something sick in that society. There's a reason some of us are like, nope, don't ever want to be part of that. But this is something else, which is, you you know, you look at how cancel culture has proven there's a, they're, they're not forgiving, right? But it only works when people don't realize how many of us are standing by and say, we will never step away from you. You know, there's almost nothing you could do that would let that happen. And that's what, that's what happens under the dissidents in, prior to, you know, during what we can learn from them, all the way to like the purges that happened with, you know, um, stuff like that. And then the second part, what you can do really is start to find ways to build what they call parallel poly, like little small things, like, you know, stuff, conversations like this, or, you know, look for, like, I'm always looking for people to collaborate with and, you know, just say, let's just do something. Let's just try it. Let's just go for it. And also recognize the fact that um, for a long time, I think there's an, to recognize, especially when it comes, when I, and I keep going back to the arts because I think that there's a lot of people who are actually artists out there who don't relate to, nor would want to relate to the artistic culture of today because it's become so political. I, I know what that's like. And art unshackled from politics suddenly opens up an entire world where you've got people who can suddenly start creating things. And that's one of the things too, is that when you, when you sort of work and, and um, exercise the liberty of the mind, when you are making things, anything, that is something that allows for the possibility, the real possibility of ways to truly combat and end the period that we're in and the direction it's going. Because that's, in my opinion, really, it's the arts that's always been the thing that stopped the stuff. And also, the last part is this, is this, and this sounds a little, don't, how do I put this? I think that in order to really work out, you know, fight the censorship is, is to sort of look at things in a very, um, like look at history, study, read about what, especially people like poets and playwrights and painters, when they talk about censorship, how they talk about it, what, what they notice, because the thing that I think people don't seem to understand, and, and, I, and I think this is something that's really frightening right now, is that, you know, when somebody, for example, gets cut, hit off, cut off of uh, social media, right? Like, like I know what happened to you with Twitter, right? The no one talks about what else that does, you know, cutting people off from our community, because we we like to pretend that you know Twitter is not real life and the internet is. Like, well, the last two years is all I've very much shown that there is when it's at its best. I'm sorry when when the internet and, and all like are at the best, it is absolutely part of real life. That's what it was supposed to be. It, it, part of it, not like all of it, right? Yeah, just, but like meeting at a cafe. I mean, think about it. It's like we we don't teleportation, but we kind of do, mm -hmm. right? And so, to acknowledge that when you cut people off, it's not just that you're cutting off somebody's maybe somebody who makes money on on you know monetized. I'll say that you know, 
I was just, I just tweeted out how much I miss Nick, Nick Hudson because he was someone and is someone that he impacted and affected my life in ways that I'm grateful for and is inspirational. And that's valuable. I mean, you can't put a, you can't put a, uh, pe 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 there's no cost there, but there's a value, right? Yes. Like price, cost, value, price, cost, value, right? What, how much is something? Zero, but is there a price you pay? Yes, or is there value to, yes, no, you know what I mean? Yeah. And so I'd say that to also start to realize that, um, and I would say this to anybody who's on the side of, um, you know, especially people call it, you know, being libertarian, saying that, you know, a company can do whatever thing they want. You know, shunning, it's a big deal. Like, you know, the human body responds to it, like you're, like you're threatened, your life is threatened. And so I'd say that when someone is censored or something, the thing we can all do, you know, is really rally around a person who's censored or feels afraid of being censored and show them that they're not alone. Like, you know, one of the people that I'm so proud of is Joseph Mas is Massey, you know, the, the poet. Is that how you say his last name? I mean, look at how great he's done. And I can't help but say that, I, I, I you know, maybe those of us who, when he first got canceled, you know, that came and said, don't worry, we, we got you. Like, that's, I mean, we all need that because with the thing about being creative is the, the, the risk is always much higher than the reward in a sort of fourth dimension kind of way, right? In the, beyond that, it's, you know, the, it, you know, there's the, the price of not saying or doing or creating something that you want to make is, 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 you know, can't even explain it, right? Like what would be the price of you not being able to play, right? Or mm -hmm. create it, work on a game. It's, it's, it's something you can't articulate, but um, we have to, I think we just need to really as much as humanly possible, um, do all we can to take advantage of these ways of communicating or even creating other ways for people to come together. I mean, I, I've always been thinking about trying to find a way to create a community for, um, you know, the uncancelable, because that's <laughs> honestly what was done in Europe. I mean, my mother will tell many stories. I mean, the way that people came together and, you know, knew they could trust each other in a world where they couldn't, I mean, We've we've experienced this. I know I have. The people that I can trust is it's this is their their their, you know it's um, that's the good thing that can come out of anything. We now know what matters. I think. Right? <laughs> yeah. But but like but but in all honesty, and also when, if people start you know belittling or saying that all art is this or all that, you know if they start acting like bigots because of being surrounded by bigotry, call them out on it. But not you know not the way they you know it's just saying it's not true. You know, don't, and, and also and the biggest thing too is don't be afraid to be wrong. That's another thing I would say. Like a lot of people self-censor because they're so afraid to be wrong. And then once you are wrong, just say, oh, I'm wrong. Okay. I think I, I, I like that because to me, it's a certainty that you will be wrong someday. So what you might as well accept it and be willing to speak in the first place. <laughs> well, well, yeah. And also that's, it goes to show that like having, I think that there's a weird, there's a weird thing that's happened in the way we, we communicate lately. It's like people are more interested in being right than they are about being curious and exploring. And it creates this weird intellectual insecurity, which I don't understand. And I think it's, it's silly. Mm -hmm. um, and amongst our intellectual class, so to speak, you see it a lot. Like there's this un, like really, I hate to use this word. I can't believe I'm using this word in, on YouTube, déclassé way of being with one another like there's something that's gone like there's no it's that same lack of deference but there's a great 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 video of um leonard bernstein at uh carnegie hall talking about um i can't remember the there's a there's a, a pianist who was playing a bach in a way he totally i can't remember the guy's name right now but he was a modern uh composer and he's saying i don't agree with this i don't think it's but why why am i conducting it I'm conducting it because that's what we do. Like, you know, you, you know, the, the, he, he, he talks about it. It's the be, ability to disagree with each other. And we see um, the way that people go after each other in that world. Like, oh my gosh, polite society is not polite at all. <laughs> I, mean, I don't want to be with them. <laughs> we need to create a, like a, a non-intellectual intellectual class.
Yes, <laughs> I, I, I agree with that. We, should, we, 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 still think... it, we should, I wish, I wish we could call it clown world, even because I, I love clowns. I think that calling yeah. everything a clown world is a shame because clowns are awesome. <laughs> clowns, reflect things, but you know, I don't know. We'll come up with a name. I, I, I agree with Modern you that we, we still need smart people. We still need intellectuals. It's just that I can't, there's a, there's a level of intellectualism that allows itself to um, trick its own brain into yeah, well, thinking I, really dumb ideas. Well, I think that it's also, my mom calls it um, at people who are educated past their capacity. <laughs> That's yeah. Uh, right. And, and also Ian McGilchrist, and I mentioned him earlier, he, he touches on this in an amazing way. He talks about what really the difference is between the left and the right brain. And he, he says that we're living in a time where it's like the left brain wants to burn the whole thing down <laughs> because it, it's, it's a brilliant, he's brilliant. It's this idea of, um, um, you know, the left, the, what, and it's actually, if you think about it, it's true. There's a lot of people who are very intelligent, who are very, very left brain. The left brain doesn't know that it's not the smartest thing in the room. <laughs> right brain so they, they, he calls it one of his books is the master and its emissary and he says that the right brain is the wise guy the wise man in, in the village who's been doing great job with the village and you know being the wise man and then he realizes he needs to delegate some of the stuff and he delegates it to the left brain the left brain is not wise enough to realize that he hasn't done it all on his own because he's done a really good job like doing all the stuff that was delegated and he then tries to take over and the left brain is, is you know when you have a, a all all biological forms have, have asymmetrical hemispheres that have a different role and it's because we all have to you know eat and not be eaten and that's actually a lot more complicated so the eat and not be eaten part is you know the left brain only sees what's in front of it you know it'll only see it it categorizes things it it's the thing that um um will convince like it, it can convince itself of something but it only it doesn't it thinks very binary it's very you know make sure you know bad good like you know all that stuff it's also what engages most when you have ptsd it's the part mm. that it's the part that the right brain processes and the left brain reacts. Like it's the thing that's the fight or flight, all that stuff. And then the right brain is the one that, you know, can, can it's, it's, it's the part that, uh, it's the, it's the, people think that the left brain is all math, for example. And one of the things Chris says is uh, it's actually been the right, you know, the, the people who come up with great equations, they actually know it before they prove it often. Like <laughs> and knowing it before you prove it is the right brain, right? Yeah. And so, you know, we're dealing in a time now where we've got a bunch of very left brain thinkers. Um, a, a lot of the, the neuro, you know, people who are on the, you know, some people who are uh, neuroatypicals can tend to be more left brained in a lot of ways sometimes than, than have a balance in it. Not always, but a lot of it. And it's very binary and it's a very, so we've got these people that they're not working their right brain. They're working, you know, brain, brain. And so, you know, that's why it's like, if it's not, uh, you know, you, everything has to be peer reviewed and everything has to be. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. The peer review, uh, slavery, uh, is, is, uh, it's, insane. It's, it's insane. It's not helpful. Um, no. mostly it, because it, yeah. it's, it's expert. What's it? If you've got expertise, but no experience, what the fuck? Yeah. <laughs> Essentially. Um, I mean, look, we've proved it now. I mean, look at our last two years. I mean, the last yeah, thing I would ever want to know from is a public health expert. I won't, I, and a bioethicist is the biggest <laughs> moron I've ever heard. Uh, uh, expertise is, is just um, for sale to me. It has been for more than a decade. That's has always been my thought on expertise. It's also, if you, if you can have a degree that gives you expertise, listen, we, let's remember Woodrow Wilson had a PhD. So did Otto von Dix, who was the guy who he had a double PhD, and he he was responsible for murdering thirty thousand Jews. So, academic, you know, the, there's a saying from Romania too. Under, I can't remember Mircea something. He said, uh, "I do not trust the academy, and I have no one to complain to." <laughs> this is like nineteen thirty. So, this, there's a this. That's the other thing. We live in a time. I think people talk to. Um, people who live on, lived under communism, talk to people from Eastern Europe, Cuba, Venezuela, China, um, talk to older people who won't be here much longer, ask them questions about it, ask them what it was really like and encourage them, especially I think Eastern for Eastern Europe. That's one of the things that's so tragic about what's going on in, in, in Russia and Ukraine right now, because it, it feels to me it's another way of dividing us because Eastern Europeans, we've never been very good at, you know, we're all very different people. I mean, you know, um, but we need, to speak i mean that's the thing anybody who's listening to this who, who come from the same background we have to speak up now like it's 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 not a, and i and listen it's scary and i get why it's scary because it coming to a for many people coming to america this place 
goes, we know there is nowhere to go because it's, it's, it's not the place. It's the principles that we would lose. If we lose those principles, those principles are tough. Like it's a, I mean, we'll still have them. I mean, as long as you can, nobody it was in, um, what's in it? What is it? Uh, Douglas Murray saying, what's in here? The bastards can't take. Oh uh, yeah. So, well, uh, this has been amazing. We went way long. Uh, oh, and, but <laughs> I really, you know. I really appreciated you coming on. Uh, if, uh, my viewers out there, she has her own YouTube channel. You can hear more of her ruminations on these things. She is really amazing at quoting things, uh, as demonstrated from this episode, uh, Juana's memory for words is amazing. Uh, <laughs> my DMs are open, by the way, I always leave them open. So folks are always welcome. <laughs> They're always welcome if they have any, anything they would like to talk about this stuff. I'm always willing. Cause I know there's a lot of people who actually would like to talk about this stuff and they're afraid. And, uh, I'll do spaces again about this stuff too, if you ever want. Well, thank you again so much for coming on. Thank you for uh, having me. You're welcome. Uh, this has been 451 Degrees, the anti-censorship the anti censorship podcast on uh, the Unsafe Space Network. Thank you guys for watching. If you could watch, watch your fingers over to the like, shares, and subscri subscribe buttons. I cannot speak right now. I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> I would really appreciate it. Uh, where are they? They're down there. Or, no, maybe they're over that way. Wherever I'm not they sure. are. Yeah, wherever they are, click them. And yep. uh, thank you so much. And uh, we will see you next time. Thanks for sticking around until the end. If you're new to Unsafe Space, check out our deep content library that includes discussions with everyone from James Lindsay to Brett Weinstein. And please consider helping to fund our work by visiting unsafespace.com slash donate. You can find us on a variety of social media platforms, and you can find a community of like-minded individuals on our Unsafe Space Discord server which is open to financial supporters at any level. We hope to see you there. Warning, this is an unsafe space. Dangerous ideas have been detected. The content of this production may corrupt previous psychological programming. If you encounter any of the following individuals, Please administer government-issued neurotoxin immediately. I'm not sure what the neurotoxin will do because I am not a biologist. CRT is a complex legal theory that is needed to combat the epidemic of racist babies. If you think about it, no one should be allowed to express opinions. But don't. Think about it, I mean. That's not your job. Thinking has been scientifically proven to be less efficient than compliance. Science, scientific, and scientifically are registered trademarks of the World Economic Forum. Unauthorized use is prohibited. Computer voice courtesy. Never mind, that last line is fake news. Please disregard it and return to your safe space immediately. There will be cake.